You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Brian Banks. Brian, how are we? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Anytime, brother. Yeah. Listen, very fascinating story. Rising football star. Had everything at your feet. Yeah. Falsely accused by some fucking evil woman. And um, spent five years in prison, six years in prison, five years on tag. Yeah. Life ruined, destroyed. And um, yeah, it's heartbreaking to see. It's heartbreaking to see how people can do things in this world. And listen, mm-hmm. The majority of sexual crimes come from men, yeah. but also the majority of false ac- ac- accusations come from women. So, first and foremost, how are you? I'm good. You know, it's uh, it's definitely a journey uh, to sit here and tell you that I don't relive the experience or still deal with what I went through years ago would be a, a bald-faced lie. Um, but I will say that I've learned how to manage uh, the experience and what that experience has done to me. I've been able to turn that negative into many positive wins. Um, so today I'm in a good space. You know, I've got a little family. I've got a five-year-old boy. I've got a beautiful lady that I will soon call my wife. Um, and I'm free. So I'm good. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. You're seeing all the positives in life. And like we spoke before, the cameras were on. It's holding that bitterness and hatred and and people can see all... Oh, it's hard for people to say because they've never lived that experience. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's difficult. My job is only to guide the experience and the journey that you've had to then how you've overcome it where people can maybe pick up life lessons. But before we get into everything, brother, I always like to go back to the start with my guests, yeah. get more of an understanding about you, Brian, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. Oh, man. So I grew up in Southern California in the city of Long Beach, California. And Long Beach is uh, pretty notorious in, in the U.S. You know, we got Snoop Dogg and a lot of uh, famous football players, athletes, musicians, Cameron Diaz. A lot of celebrities have come from the city. Um, so it's always, uh, you know, as you grow up in our city, there's this uh, there's this saying, you're either going to do one or the other. You're going to get in the streets or you're going to get into sports or some type of music or whatever the case may be. And um Very early on in my life, I would say around nine or 10 years old, my mom got us, my younger brother and my older sister, got us involved into sports, various types of sports from karate to basketball, football. Um, And as a young kid, um, everybody always thought that I was going to be some six foot 10, seven foot tall guy because I was always tallest kid in class. I was always tallest kid of my age. Um, So naturally basketball was something that was pushed more than any other sport. And it wasn't until I got till, you know, I played one year of Pop Warner football, which is, you know, a youth league. Uh, I was was 10 playing with 12 year olds. I did that for a year, didn't really like football and uh, decided to focus on basketball, you know, believe in the the story of I'm going to be this tall kid. And, um, it wasn't until I got to, I would say, my freshman year in high school, it's my ninth grade year, um, that, to make a long story short, I was uh, persuaded to give football another shot and actually was, you know, really fucking good at it. Mm-hmm. And um, so I ditched basketball my sophomore year, uh, completely focused on football. And by the end of my sophomore year, I was, ra- um, no, excuse me, by the end of my sophomore year, I received my first recruiting letter from uh, the University of Southern California, USC. Uh, at that time, Pete Carroll was the head coach who is, uh, well, which he was the head coach of Seattle Seahawks. And um, I remember when I got that first recruiting letter my sophomore year, it really, uh, it really um, gave importance to the sport of football and it really showed me the opportunities that could uh, come from playing that sport. And so I really uh, totally gave it my all once I got that first recruiting letter. And I remember by the end of my junior year in high school, which was the, the following year, 
Um, I finished that year ranked 11th in the nation as a middle linebacker. Um, I was being recruited by every Division I university you could think of. I could have went to any school and played, you know, played ball on a full scholarship. Um, I committed to USC. Uh, they were, that school was, uh, you know, close to my heart growing up. You, you see other linebackers like Mike Pollard played a game and played it so well. Uh, and the, the legacy that he left at that university, um, you know, it, it really left a, a huge mark in my life as far as what I wanted to be and who I looked up to. And uh, so here I was the summer of my, the summer going into my senior year in football, ranked 11th in the nation. Um, I'm in newspapers, I'm in magazines, I'm I had my own mailbox on my high school campus. It was about a handful of us that were being recruited so heavily by universities that we would show up on campus and we had our own mailbox on school. And I would just have stacks of recruiting mail every single day, we'd take it home, show my mom. She just, you know, she's just baffled that it's starting to really take, you know, take, take place in my life. Um, that summer, going into my senior year, I was uh, in summer school. I was making up, you know, credits that I didn't really, you know, get in during the season, the regular school season. And uh, at that time, and I'm making a long story uh, here because I think there's there's some parts here that people really have never heard about how things actually transpired and took place. That day that I was in summer school on campus that this whole thing took place, there was a, a film crew that was supposed to show up at our high school campus. They were filming a, a documentary about the number one uh, high school football team in the nation versus the number two high school football team in the nation, Concord de la Salle, which is uh, Northern California. We were ranked number one and we were gonna have the first, excuse me, the second uh, national high school football game that had ever been played in the, in the US. And um, I was slated to be uh, our, our defensive leader, one of our team leaders. And so this film crew wanted to um, film a, a separate portion of this documentary that they were putting together, solely focused on the leaders of the team. And on this morning, they were supposed to arrive on our, fo- on our high school campus. They were gonna follow me around school, kind of show my day in and day out of you know, what school life was like you know, for, for me. So here I am, I'm in class, I'm waiting on this dude to show up. I still remember his name, it's just like Dan Freeman. I, I haven't talked to him since. But I remember talking to him the day before and he was like, I'll be there, I'm gonna you know, follow you around. And so, you know, I, I was you know, excited about it. Here in high school, you, you, you know, you're hearing, you're gonna have cameras follow you around. So I'm sitting here and you know, f- you know, foot tap and I'm just waiting for this guy to show up so I can parade around school with these cameras. And time passed, time passed, another period, another class, guy still didn't show up. Um, so the last period of the school day, I remember um, kind of getting fed up. I don't know where the fuck is this dude at? And uh, at this time, this was in 2002, cell phones weren't really huge at that time in our high school. It was only a select few of people that had cell phones. There was a girl in my class who had a cell phone. And I remember asking her, let me use your phone, I'm gonna step outside and I'm gonna call this guy and see where he is. And so she gives me the phone and I raise my hand, I ask my teacher, let me kind of step outside, I'm gonna use the phone, I'll step right back in. Now literally my plan was to do exactly that, step outside the door, use the phone and come back into class. Um, The teacher instead said, okay, you can step out and use the phone, but if you step out, I want you to take these papers to the front office and deliver them for me. There's some schoolwork or whatever it was. So I said, cool, I'll take them. That took me away from class. Um, and so as I'm trying to make this phone call and get in touch with Dan, I've got these you know, papers in my hand. I'm walking to an entirely different side of the campus. And as I go into the office, I hand these papers in and I'm wake, m- making my way back to class. I run into a girl that I've known since my middle school days. Um, so, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. I've known her older sister. They knew my younger brother. You know, we kind of grew up in the same neighborhood somewhat. Um, but for the most part, we all know each other. 
And so I'm walking back to class. I run into her. We exchange and hugs, small talk. And that small talk led to flirting. That flirting led to us agreeing to go to a known makeout spot that was on our campus. We had a few different places on campus that everybody knew. You could take a significant other. You can go and kiss, make out, and do whatever you want to do in your own privacy. And that was your thing. So we agree, let's go to the spot. We start making our way there. Um, now, in order to get to the spot, you had to go into uh, this building called the 700 building, which was technically off limits to all kids except for a higher educational program. And there was an adult, adult nursing program that took place downstairs. So the spot, in order to get there, you had to go through the front door of the 700 building, pass these adult classes, go upstairs, either through a flight of stairs or take the elevator. And once you get to the second floor, you had to, I mean, like, you know, on ninja toes, you had to literally tiptoe through this corridor uh, where there's classes open, in session, teachers, teacher's aides, full of students, everything. So you had to literally make your way through it in silence without getting caught because if you're not supposed to be there, they'd recognize you, they know you're not supposed to be there, you could literally get in trouble for it. So we go up into the 700 building, we get into the elevator, we go up to the second floor, we come out and we are both on the same page. We know what we have to do to get to the spot. So we're quietly walking through this hallway, we make it past, no one sees us. At the end of the hallway, there's a, a back stairs that takes you back down to the first floor at the landing of that bottom uh, step at the, the the first floor there's just a small little space before the door opens up and you're back out into you know back outside of the building but that door is locked from the outside and the only people who could basically come in are from you know it's from the exact same place that we came from which was upstairs um, so it's kind of a secluded little nook in the back of a building that is the known makeout spot. So we successfully make our way to this spot uncaught. We get there um, and we start making out, we're kissing, we're touching. Um, at one point, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, OK, this is starting to progress. I'm thinking, you know, in my mind, yeah, we're probably going to have sex. And so I'm like. We're getting into it, we're kissing, we're touching, we're making out, and pants are unbuckled. I remember my pants being kind of like halfway down, you know, to like mid-thigh, and her pants mid-thigh. And, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's a piece that I've, you know, I've never shared, and the reason I personally have never shared it, and it's crazy that I haven't shared it publicly, um, but the reason I haven't shared it is, is <laughs> because I do have a, a sense of respect for women and I do have a, I have, I have a sister, I have a mother, I have cousins who are females. Um, and never in my life would I want to do or say something that, uh, could bring embarrassment to a woman. But while we were making out and I was touching her, um, I started to put my hands between her legs and touch her there. And um, this smell just hit me. It's very bad smell coming from her. And I mean, it was to a point to where it just threw me off. I just, you know, I went from being excited, turned on and, and ready to go to, ah, I need to get the fuck out of here, you know? And uh, I never said it to her, you know, I backed off. I started to slow down with the making out. And eventually I made up this excuse about, you know, I gotta get back to class. I've been gone for too long. I took papers, I did this, I gotta go. She got mad, she got this attitude. She, you know, I made this abrupt stop. She didn't like it and you could see it on her face. So I make a few jokes like, hey, don't trip. You know, we, we gonna get back to this. You know, let me just get back to class. Let me finish this and we gonna, you know, now that I know what's up, we'll, we'll do it, you know? So she laughs kind of, you know, a little faint laugh and I felt like that was enough you know got myself fixed up I hit out the double doors that were you know the locked doors I went out and went back to class and that was it I finished school 
Uh, Dan, the reporter, the guy who was doing the documentary, never showed up, never returned the call. I still don't know what happened to this day with that guy. Um, but uh, I remember school being let out, and right after school was football practice within about two or three hours. So normally what we would do is a, a group of our teammates, buddies, we would leave campus, and about a block away from our school was a very famous burger spot that we'd all go to. Um, so we went there, we had food, we ate, trying to kill time before football practice started. Finished eating, made our way back to campus. We're on campus and we probably had about an hour and a half before school, before practice started. So we're sitting um, on these benches, uh, which are kind of in the, the center of the schoolyard. And we're just hanging out, waiting for, you know, waiting for the time to pass. And as we're sitting there shooting the shit, talking, you see one police officer walk by and goes into the main office building. Okay. Two, another one shows up. Here comes a pair. Another pair shows up. So we started to notice this heavy presence of police officers starting to build on our campus, going into our main building. And everybody's, you know, in my school, you know, Long Beach Poly is in the center of not the best neighborhood. You know, it's the hood. Uh, so to see police on our campus was not unusual. There was always some going on, heavy gang activity in our neighborhood. There was gang activity in our school campus. So it wasn't unusual to see police. But the number of police that we were seeing, you know, really took our attention. Took our attention so much so that I remember getting up from that bench and I literally walked to one of the police officers. I said, hey man, what's going on? You know, I was very outspoken when I was young and I didn't have a problem talking to people. Hey, what's going on? And I guess the police didn't know who exactly he was looking for at the time. He says, oh, I don't know, man. I, you know, I didn't finish school, so I'm back to finish school. He made some kind of, you know, weak joke attempt. And I, you know, I, all right, whatever. I shunned him off. I went back to sit down with the homies. They asked me, what do you say? I'm, nothing. I guess it's nothing. So we go back to just hanging out, waiting for practice to start. About five or 10 minutes later, um, a teammate's dad, who would always show up to every practice and every game, He's coming in the same direction from where the police were coming from onto campus and headed towards us. He gets towards us. He he takes he he says, Brian, let me talk to you real quick. And he pulls me away from everybody. And he said, hey, man, when I was walking on campus right now, I heard the police say that they were looking for a kid by the last name of Banks. Did you do something today? Did you get in trouble? I said, they ain't looking for me. I didn't do nothing. He's like, are you sure, you know, you didn't get into any trouble today to make the police want to come? I said, man, I don't, you know, I'm not involved in nothing. He said, okay, well, check with your younger brother to make sure he didn't get into any trouble because I'm I'm pretty sure they said banks. So I said, all right, I'll go check with my bro. My brother was in basketball practice on the other side of campus. So I head over to where he was. He's in practice. I pull him out of practice. I said, hey, come here. He's like, what's up? He's his first year in high school. I said, what'd you do today? I didn't do nothing. I said, bro, what did you do today? I swear I didn't do anything. I said, are you sure? Because supposedly police are looking for somebody last somebody with the last name of Banks. And he's like, I didn't do nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm straight. I said, okay, go back to practice. He goes back to practice and I head back to, I'm starting to walk back to where my guys were waiting for practice, for football practice. As I'm walking back over there, I'm, you know, I'm thinking, I'm wondering if what the, 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 my teammates dad said was even true. Did he hear the right thing? And so I remember before I went back to my homeboys, I went to this, these steps. It was kind of like a, a two step right outside the parking lot of our school campus. And I just sat there for a bit and I'm thinking like, what the fuck is going on now? This whole time I'm thinking not once in my mind, am I thinking, there's somebody on campus accusing me of rape. Now, one time I'm thinking the girl that I was just making out with went and called the police on me and there's an issue. Not even in my mind. I'm sitting there on these steps. I had my feet up on one step. I'm sitting up on a higher step and I have my show, my forearms on my knees and I'm just kind of sitting there at the parking lot. And maybe a few minutes later, from the left side of my face, corner of my eye, I see the girl who made up the accusation, her mom, her older sister, and about three or four police officers exiting the campus. And I'm saying they literally walked right by me. 
I don't know how they didn't see me. I was sitting right there on the steps. The steps are at the door. They exited and made a left towards the police cars. When I saw that, my whole like heart just dropped. I'm like, oh, shit. And the reason I said all oh, shit was not because I'm thinking this girl is accusing me of sexual assault. I'm saying, oh, shit, because this girl is her mom is a known gang member, been in and out of prison, drugs, very aggressive. And she is very much in the likeness school bully, kicked out of class a lot, you know, shit starter fighting girls. She was a very rough, you know, you know on the rough edge. So I'm thinking, fuck, she probably did something, got in trouble. They saw me moving around with her today on campus and they probably want to talk to me about it. And I'm like, I ain't got nothing to do with it. I'm not going to deal with it. So I remember when they left the parking lot and they turned left to the police cars, I stood up and I went to the right of the parking lot. And as soon as I got out of view of them bending around the parking lot, I just went into a full sprint out of the parking lot through the baseball field of our our team's baseball field i ran across the field went out the the back gate and i went to my homeboy's house who lived two blocks away from the high school campus his spot was another area that a bunch of student a bunch of football players will go to waiting for practice he had like nintendo 64 and playstation so they would go play games and everything and wait for practice that's the nearest phone I knew I could get to. I'm like trying to call mom. So I'm running to the phone. I'm out through the, through the parking lot, through the school, two blocks down. I bust into his door. I'm sweating frantically. And everybody's like, yo, what the fuck? What's, what's going on? What's going on? It's like eight, nine guys in there playing games. And I said, damn, I think the police are looking for me. And everybody start busting out laughing. <laughs> You know, it was, <laughs> they're like, yeah, whatever. And I'm like, no, I swear to God, I think the police are looking for me. They're like, for what? I'm like, man, I don't know. I don't have a clue. I was like, let me use your phone. I hop on the phone, call my mom. She's in school. All right, she was a teacher. She's still a teacher. Call my mom. I said, mom, I think the police are looking for me. She says, for what? I was like, I don't know. I don't know. But I, someone told me the police are looking for me. And there's police on campus. And she's like, well, what did you do today? I said, I didn't do nothing. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I didn't do anything that would make the police want to come talk to me. You know, I didn't tell my mom I made out with a girl on campus. And so she goes, well, if you didn't do anything, then don't worry about it. And I was like, I don't know. Something just don't feel right. And she said, okay, well, then come home. So I said, all right, I'm going to come home. I skipped practice. I left my book bag in my homeboy's house. And I jetted to the nearest bus that I can catch, uh, the uh, public transit. And I took the bus home. And... Probably took me about an hour to get home. I get home. My mom's at the house at that time. She had got off work and made it home. And so she asked me again, what happened? What's going on? I'm like, I don't know. I just, someone told me the police were looking for me. And, you know, obviously I don't, I didn't do anything. So I don't know what's going on. She said, well, it, you probably overreacting and overthinking the situation. Don't worry about it. And so I let it go. I said, okay, cool. I went back into my room. I took a shower. I was hot and it was summertime. After I got out of the shower, I um, jumped in bed. I was tired. I went and took a nap and I laid down, fell asleep. I was awakened uh, out of my sleep by this pressure pushing down into the middle of my back, sinking me into the bed. I'm laying on my stomach and uh, I can feel this just pushing me down, pushing me down, pushing me down. So naturally I wake up and I jolt. Then I'm like, what the? And I hear like, don't move, stay still, stay right there. Don't move, don't move. Put your hands behind your back. And I'm like, what? Put your hands behind your back. I'm putting my hands behind my back. And um, man, they handcuffed me and uh, they yanked me up off the bed. And when I get yanked off the bed, that's when I'm finally seeing what's going on in my room. There's like three, four police officers in the room. They got the guns out. They're not pointing at me, but they like got them down. I guess I'm a big kid. I was uh, 16. I was 6'1", 6'2", about 225, you know, and I guess they, they felt they needed to treat me as a, an adult. I don't know. So guns are out. I'm handcuffed. They're barking orders at me, telling me to find clothes to wear, asking me where the clothes that I wore to school today. I'm showing them where the clothes were. I'm picking out something to wear and I'm getting, they're dressing me up with the handcuffs on, throwing a sweater over my head, 
and they are forcing me out of my bedroom, down the stairs, and out of the house into a police car. And I remember as I'm leaving my room, my mom's room was just a J, like just down the hallway upstairs from mine. You come out of my door, her door is facing my door. Bathroom, closet, her door. And uh, to this day, man, I, I, I've i never seen something that really affected me more than that than this was my mom uh dropping to the ground on both of her knees and and screaming at the top of her lungs just in in pain and just saying no and why and you know please don't take my baby and what's going on and you can't do this i mean she's screaming and crying and i'm being pushed and led out of the house and i'm they throw me into the back of this police car and i'm a big kid the police cars are Know, super small, super tight, and they throw me in with the cuffs behind behind my back, and um, <laughs> on a small note, it's, it's uh, I remember these two kids were playing out in the front yard a few houses away, and once they slammed the door and walked away, these two kids were looking to see what was going on, and then they, probably like eight, nine-year-olds, they walk up to the police car, and they kind of look put their hands on the glass and they look through and here I am handcuffed and sweating and uh, I don't know why I remember that so much. It just felt like I was like I was a fish in a fishbowl and all of a sudden I, I was no longer a part of the real world that and I you know I had these kids like staring me down. Anyways the police eventually get into the car two guys one driver one passenger and they begin driving off. Now mind you I I hadn't been told what was going on yet. I didn't know what was going on yet. And it wasn't until we started driving off, we probably got to the freeway heading heading back to uh, Long Beach um, that I finally speak. I'm like, hey, yo, what's, you know, what's going on? Can y'all at least tell me what's going on? The passenger, the cop, kind of looks back halfway and he's like, yeah, man, you've been accused of rape. Said you raped some girl on your campus. Man, I... I hadn't had nothing else to say from there. I, it, it, just hearing that, uh, uh, it just, uh, I mean, what do you say? You know, obviously, I, I didn't do it, but to just be in handcuffs, uh, to be taken the way that I was taken, um, and then for, to be told that that's why I was took. It just put me in, I think I was in shock, like a little bit of shock, you know? And I just sat there in the back of the car and they drove me to a, a, a hospital to perform a, a rape kit where they, you know, I, the most invasive thing I've, to this day I've ever experienced in my life. I've been, to, I've been to prison, I've done strip searches, I've done cavity searches, I've done all of I've never experienced something more demoralizing, more humiliating uh, in my life. Um, you know, they lay you on a hospital bed. They start pulling your pubic hairs off of you so they can collect samples. They're scraping skin off a of certain, you know, doing skin scrapes off of certain parts of your body. Um, they're drawing blood and they're taking fingerprints and taking pictures, um, you know, and, and it, I mean, this is just all happening. You know, it's just all happening. And um, when they finally finished doing that, uh, my detective came in right away in the same same room, sat me down, and uh, he played good cop with me. I was 16, and he said, "Look, man, I, I know you. I know you do no mess like this. I know you. You play football. You're a good guy. Just tell me what happened. Just tell me everything, and I promise you, we, we'll figure this out. Just we just need to know what happened." And so I told him every single thing that happened, and that was enough uh, to make a case. And one in a, when you're dealing with a, a rape case or a sexual assault case, um, as long as you say that you were in the area that the crime was supposedly committed and, you know, you were there, that's enough for you to be sent to court. So I told them everything me and this girl made out, everything I told you. And they said, all right, cool. We, we, everything should be fine. You should be good. Let's just, let me let me go back, talk to some people. And we'll figure this out. Um, they took me from the police, from the hospital to a police precinct and I was in a, they put me in a holding cell 
one hour turned into two hours, two hours to three, three to four, four to six. I'm in this tank and I'm, you know, I'm freaking losing. I'm crying. I'm stressing. I'm wondering what's going on. But then at the end of my, in my mind, I'm also building this confidence of, man, they're going to figure this shit out. This is, this is some bullshit. I know they're going to figure this out. And, um, after about six or seven hours, police came and they said, look, man, we, you know, we still going over this. Um, we ain't figured it out yet. So we're going to, we're going to take you over to the local juvenile hall and you'll be there for probably a day or two until we figure this out. And that was the beginning of, of, uh, incarceration for me, man. They, they took me to Los Padrinos juvenile hall in the city of Downey. And, um, I got there probably like two, three in the morning. They couldn't put me in a cell yet. Everybody was asleep. So they put me in this day room. They gave me this makeshift bed that looks like a little raft, like a boat raft. They put a little mat inside of it and they slept me. I slept on the floor the first night. I didn't even sleep. I was awake the whole time. I just laid there in this little mat until the sun came up. And I'm thinking as soon as the sun comes up and they open this door, they're going to figure it out. I'm going home. And I was there for another day. Then I found out I had court in three days. Uh, so I literally just sat on my hands for three days. I didn't eat. I didn't come out to sell. I didn't talk to nobody because I'm just waiting for them to, you know, figure this out. Um, I went to court. I saw the judge. Uh, the judge denied bail. The judge denied me being released on my own recognizance. Why? No reason whatsoever. I had never been arrested. I had never been locked up, never even been in handcuffs. I have no international ties. I have no family in other countries we are we were basically poor so i didn't have money to flee or go anywhere and my life was football all i wanted to do was be on my, my be at school playing ball so where was i gonna go you know there was no reason to deny the bill um the only reason the bill was denied was how the detective wrote up the case that de they basically look at how it's written up what this the lies that the girl made and that put together i guess was enough for them to say he should remain in jail while fighting the case um they ended up giving me a bond of 1.25 million dollars and obviously we we didn't have that money to post that um and they scheduled me for another court date for like two months <laughs> and i read i'm laughing now but i remember thinking when i was going to go to court like you know in, in the beginning you always think they're gonna figure this shit out i'm out of here this this is crazy and every time I thought that they were going to figure it out, it just continuously got worse. So it went from, you know, sitting in a, uh, it went from sitting in the jail precinct for six hours, thinking everything would be figured out to sitting in the juvenile hall for three days, thinking everything was going to be figured out to be given two more months to sit in jail to my next court date. And then it just progressed, 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 progressed. Um, next thing you know, I'm in there for a year. I've been locked up for a year. Um, I was tried as an adult. They, I, I fought what was called a fitness hearing. Uh, in the state of California, you fight a fitness hearing. That fitness hearing determines whether or not you are fit to remain in juvenile court or you should be tried as an adult. There's a five criteria uh, uh, determination. Uh, and it's, it's like, was a crime premeditated? Do you have any priors? Were there any attempts of rehabilitation from those priors? Um, the seriousness of the case and the gravity of the case. I lost on the seriousness and the gravity of the case based off of how it was wrote up. And that alone sent me to adult court. So now I'm 17 and instead of facing minor camp time or juvenile hall time, I was now facing 41 years to life in prison. Um, they tacked on a kidnapping charge with care, which carries life in the state of California. Um, and what was happening behind the scenes, what I would later find out, which the accuser admitted to on video, was that every time she would hear my side of the story, uh, she would add more to her story because she didn't want to look like a liar because it was getting so deep on her end that she had to keep pushing the story. So while I was sitting in jail, I was in jail for one count of rape. Next thing you know, it was two counts of rape. Next thing you know, it was three counts of rape. Next thing you know, it was three counts of rape and sodomy. Next thing you know, it was three counts of rape, sodomy, and kidnapping. Now I'm facing 41 years to life. These stack, these charges just continue to stack up. And I had no clue. My mom had no clue. We didn't know how this was happening until years later, finding out 
how that all went down. Was she accusing you of rape on multiple occasions at multiple times, no. or just that one time? Every time you, every time you, you penetrate, which there was no penetration. We never had sex, but the way that the DA questioned her was, did he, did he, did he, uh, did he put it inside of your vaginally? Yeah. How many times did he try to do it? He tried to put it in there three or four times. Okay, that's three, four. That's three counts of rape. Did he try to put it anywhere else? Uh, did he try to put it in, in, in your in your butt? Oh, okay, that's out of it, it was kind of like, I don't know if they were coaxing her or she was making it up. I don't really know what was going on on that side. I just know that charges continuously kept showing up and adding them and adding up. Now, mind you, this whole time, the DNA test was never, they, they never used, uh, or my lawyer never used the DNA to disprove all of what was what was being said. This girl had accused me of penetrating her. Um, in the report, she accused me of ejaculating inside of her, that she saw and felt the contents. She described it as white and slimy. She said that it was inside of her. It was on her clothes. They did DNA testing within a couple hours of us being around each other, and there was no DNA found. Excuse me, I'll take that back. I was excluded as a source of DNA, but there was another male source of DNA found. And this girl had claimed that she was a virgin. She had, wasn't messing with other guys or anything, but they found another male source of DNA on her underwear and a secretion of her underwear. But I was excluded, but my lawyer never used the DNA. Why? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I, I, to this day, I don't know. What I can speculate um, and the way that my lawyer carried herself, uh, she was on her way to becoming a commissioner, a judge in L.A. She didn't want to lose any more cases. So she began to pretty much pawn off her cases, getting her clients to take deals to gain favor of the D.A. and district attorney's offices and the judges. So that when she did run for commissioner to become a judge, that she would get these favorable reports from the D.A.s and the judges. So the DNA was never used. It was never used in juvenile court. They sent me to adult court. I faced life in, in adult court. It was never used in adult court at all. The entire year that I fought the case. That's the mainstream of evidence. That would have, that would have disproved everything. Before the, the day of my arrest, this accuser has six different statements as to what happened. At all, six different statements on one day. And what I mean by six different statements, it was like, um, you know, we got to the 700 building and Brian grabbed me and yanked me into the elevator. And another statement, we got into the 700 building, Brian wrapped both of his arms around me, picked me up and put me into the elevator. And another statement, she said, Brian uh, grabbed me by both hands and did something. And then there was another statement where she said, I willingly walked in by myself into the elevator. He didn't force me at all. And none of that was enough to say, maybe she's lying. Is she not right in the head, huh? Uh, I was, I, I would definitely say she is not right. What mental head. health, kind of bipolar, what, something. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. I really, I really never tried to, to break down the psyche of this person. I do know, and this is not to minimize her actions um, at all. But I do know that her mom was fucking crazy. Mm -hmm. And I do know that, I mean, I could assume that if she would make up, which she did, a lie like this, and her mom found out that this was a lie, and instead you were actually on campus trying to fuck somebody, I'm pretty sure her mom would have mm -hmm. probably destroyed her. Um, so I think it was a bit of, of that. But if you ask me why this whole thing happened, it was because I walked away while we were making out. Do you think if you had had sex with her, you wouldn't have been in this predicament? Yep, I would. it would have not happened. I think she felt that I, I, my personal opinion, and we never, you know, obviously never got to the bottom of it because even through the video where she's recanting, she's still lying in that video about things. But if you ask me what I think truly happened was that she was aware that I smelled what I smelled. She was in fear that I was going to go back and tell the homies what I just experienced. And so instead of her going and dealing with that, she went back and 
told a girl in her classroom that I took advantage of her and I forced her to do everything. And this girl, she basically went back to class, wrote this note that said, Brian just raped me. How much corruption is involved? Because a lot of these lawyers and QCs that we have back home, a lot of them do deals and throw people under the bus to get their promotions. Yep. There's scandals everywhere. There's corruption everywhere. Police, law, anything. And uh, good jobs, bad. There's always good and bad people everywhere. But how much corruption do you think is involved? And does your skin colour play a part in this? Uh, I would definitely say that skin colour plays a part. But before I get into that, as far as corruption, you know, I... I know that from the moment that I was arrested, her mom filed a lawsuit on the on the school district for lack of security within days. Like it was a money grab right away. Um, so I think that that obviously played a part into the lies continuing and the lies progressing because now there was money on the line. Um, I do know that the letter that she wrote to her friend about her being raped. Um, there's two versions of this letter. There's one that's supposedly in her writing, and then there's one that's supposedly a copy of that. It's a totally different writing. I I've had it looked at by a, hand, a, a writing expert who looked at it immediately and said, that's not the same writing. So either someone rewrote the letter for no reason. Why would you rewrite it when you have the original? And if you did rewrite it, that means that you've, you know, you've enhanced it and you've done something different to it. Mind you, the girl that received that letter years later had a confrontation with the same girl who had accused me of rape and she told her that it was a lie that it never happened and that's what kind of uh, we later the investigators in my case they would later find this this young woman her name is Sherelle um, and they talked to her about it she said yeah I actually a few years later I got into an argument with her we were friends we got into an argument and I confronted her about it and she admitted that it didn't even happen. So we got her to help me in my situation. Mm -hmm. um, does does color play a part? Absolutely. Color definitely plays a part. I think you're, uh, I think finances play a part too. I think money plays a part. I think that um, who you have representing you and what you can do financially with that is going to determine a lot. But yeah, definitely, I think color plays a part. And I think being a black male of interest because I was a good football player and because I was on the way to play, you know, for university, I think there was a, uh, I think that there was a an intent to make a statement out of me to our community in a way. Um, Why doesn't your school have your back? <clears throat> no. <laughs> that kind of adds to a little bit more of the corruption. Um, the, the school initially, and I learned later that the school made every attempt that they possibly could to join my attorney in fighting this case on my behalf. They wanted to help get down to the bottom is because obviously if I lose, they get sued. My lawyer rejected all attempts of, the, of them trying to help. I do not know why. I never asked why. I never was told why. But the lawyer for the for the school district, and this is kind of going away from the, what we're talking about now, but when I was sentenced and I was in prison, the the lawsuit continued. And one day while I was on the level three uh, maximum security yard, I got a letter saying that I was going to be deposed in this lawsuit. They're going to pull me out of the cell and they're going to you know basically do a deposition uh, with her lawyer, her civil attorneys and the civil attorneys for the school district. So they ended up showing up and deposing me. And at the end of that deposition, they handcuffed me. They're taking me back to the cell. And the lawyer for the school district ran out into the hallway. And he said, one minute, can I get one minute with Brian? And um, he leaned in and he said, hey, I just want to let you know, uh, you were royally fucked in your case. His exact words, they fucked you over. We made every attempt to try to help you in this and your lawyer did not respond to us, did not get to us. Um, and um, about three weeks and three or four weeks later, I'm in my cell and um, I get called out of my cell. It's like, you got legal mail. I never get legal mail. I didn't have an attorney. I go pick up the mail and it's my case file. I had never seen my case file. I had been locked up three and a half years and I never had a copy of my own case file. Never had it. 
And um, he sent it to me because he wanted me to see what was in it. And that's what got the ball rolling to me, appealing my case and everything. I sat there in my cell and I would you know, obviously wait till like three in the morning when my celly was asleep because I'm, I'm reading sensitive shit. And I'm reading over my case. I'm reading that the DNA, I never got the results of the DNA test, even though I knew it was negative. I thought, why were you not screaming for them? I was, I was ignorant to the system. Oblivious to it. I was ignorant to the system. I, I never, we, my family, we never dealt, dealt with the legal system before. We never, none of my family was arrested or dealt with, you know, dealt with the police. I was, I, I didn't know at 16, don't talk to the police. I didn't know that. I knew, listen to the police. Yeah. And do the right thing. You've been raised right then. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. Um, so you're trying to do the right thing and it's, the, it's backfired. And it backfired. And and I never got my case file and I never questioned that because I was 16 and I didn't know I should have that. Um, When I got it, I realized the DNA evidence was right there and it was never used. I, I found out she has six different statements, six different stories. I found out that all is different stuff, you know, and, and this was only because the lawyer for the school district. Who picked your lawyer? <sighs> this also shows a bit of more of our ignorance to the system. My my mom listened to a friend of hers who said, this is the lawyer that you need to choose to help your son. <laughs> and the reason you should choose his lawyer is because she went to USC with Johnny Cochran. You know Johnny Cochran? Yeah. And that alone was like, oh, she she was in school with Johnny Cochran. Okay, so she must be, she must know something. Let's let's go with it. And that was my mom chose that lawyer because of that black woman, uh, older lady, um, and and literally treated me like a kid. I wasn't privy to any information when we were dealing with the case. Everything that was going on between her and the courts, I knew nothing about it. I I, I and she would come and visit me. She barely came to visit. The few times that she would come and visit, it was just she would ask a few miscellaneous questions. She would flip through some paperwork and then she'd disappear. And then she'd have an investigator of hers show up, which my mom had to pay for as well. He'd ask a bunch of questions. I'd give him all the phone numbers and people to go talk to, to, you know, to help him figure this out. I found out that that investigator never went to the campus, never went to the supposed crime scene, never talked to any of the the people that we said that they should speak to. Uh, my mom sold her house, sold her car, sold all her property to pay for this lawyer and her investigator. She lost everything. And they did nothing. I mean, for an entire year of me sitting in jail, it was it was literally just continuances of court dates. Oh, judge, we're not ready yet. Uh, I'm going on vacation. Oh, the DA is going on vacation. Oh, the judge is on vacation. Oh, we need more time. Oh, let's push it back. I would go to court thinking everything would be resolved every single time. And every time it was come back in two months come back in three months, come back in a month, come back in four months. Uh, and really no really good explanation as to why other than everybody had a, other shit to do, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, we, we didn't know about the law. We didn't know when to start screaming. We didn't know who to scream to. We didn't have the money to, to scream. You gotta have money. You can yell all you want to. Everybody in prison is innocent, technically. You know what I mean? So how long did it take before it went to trial? One year? One year, and like, it didn't go, we didn't even go to trial. Because you pleaded? I ended up pleading no contest to it, and I was I was forced into that deal from, that, her, from my lawyer. That woman again? The day of jury selection, that woman. I, we were supposed to go into court. She kept trying to get me to take deals that entire year. When I was in juvenile court, she wanted me to take a deal for juvenile life, which means you go to uh, California Youth Authority, which is prison for uh, youth under 18. Juvenile life is you serve uh, up to twenty uh, up to the age of twenty five, and then you're released. Nine years. Uh, yeah, she wanted me to plea out to juvenile to to take juvenile life and go to CYA. And I said no. I got tried as an adult. Then she uh, there was a deal they offered me for twenty five years, and then there was a deal for like eighteen years, and then there was a deal for nine years again. And I'm saying no to everything. I'll go to my mom like, mom, they said twenty five. She's like, oh, did you do it? I'm like, no. We fighting it. We fight. We're not taking no deals. So we kept saying no, no, no. The day of jury selection, we're going to trial. I'm in. I you know take me to court. I'm in the I'm in the tank waiting to get pulled out to go see the judge to select his jury. And instead, they pull me out and they pull me into this interview room. I'm in this little tank. And it's just like this, just with that glass in the middle. 
you know, free side, locked up side. My lawyer comes in, big smile on her face. She's hyped up, energetic. And so I'm thinking, oh shit, here's some good news. What's going on? She comes in, she sits down. She's, okay, look, I just talked to the DA. I just came up with this 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 deal. I mean, this is a great deal, Brian. Brian, you, you got to take this. This is the deal you have to take. I'm like, what? what's going on? Okay, listen, this is the deal. If you plead no contest to one count of rape, just one count, that they will then re get rid of all the other charges. You will go to Chino State Prison, and during your stay, you'll you'll go for 90 days. It's gonna call it a 90 day diagnostic or 90 day observation. You're gonna stay in prison for 90 days, and during that 90 day stay, you're gonna be uh, eventually interviewed by a psychologist and a counselor who will determine on a ladder system whether you are to receive felony probation, three years or six years in prison. And she said, Brian, I promise you, I guarantee you, you will get that favorable report. And after 90 days, you're gonna get felony probation. You'll be out, you can go back to school, you get back to playing football, you get back on with your life. If you do not take this deal, you're gonna walk into that courtroom and all they're gonna see is a big black teenager and you're gonna be found guilty. They're gonna find you guilty. You're facing 41 years to life. Now I'm telling you that you're gonna get felony probation after 90 days. I need to know what you wanna do. And I'm sitting here going, first of all, I'm thinking, I'm in juvenile hall while this is all helping. I mean, I'm with the youth, right? I'm, I'm 17. First thing I heard was go to Chino State Prison. <laughs> what the fuck? One of the most notorious prisons in the state of California. Hands down, you say Chino, People go, okay, you went to Chino, respect. It's that kind of place. You're gonna go to Chino for 90 days. I, what? <laughs> and so I'm sitting here and I'm and I'm like, well, let me talk to my mom. I gotta talk, you know, every every deal that y'all bring me, I'll talk to my mom. And she said, no, can't talk to your mom this time. Because I gotta go in there and tell it, I gotta tell a DA and a judge what you wanna do right now. You're in adult court. You gotta make an adult decision by yourself. I need to know what you want to do right now. So she pressed me, pushed me up against the corner. And I sat there in tears for about maybe three or three, four minutes. I'm crying. I mean, just flowing down my face and I'm, I'm feeling the defeat. You know, I'm, this is it. Like I got to take this deal. I'm hearing what she's saying. She's putting it on thick. It makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm 17. I guess this should make sense. She's saying it. She's telling me I'm gonna be found guilty. If I go in there, I'm big and black. I, she knows she's a lawyer, you know? And I'm crying. I'm saying, are you sure? And why? And is this the only way? And please let me talk to my mom. And Brian, I need a decision. I need it. I need to go. I need to tell him what you want to do. Come on. What do you want to do? You want to go to trial and risk it all? Or you want to take the deal? So after a year of fighting the case, uh, I, I took the deal. And I remember walking to that courtroom. My mom was in there family members there, some friends there, and everyone's thinking I'm coming out to select jury. And uh, I went into that courtroom and uh, the judge started laying out the, the grounds for me pleading no contest. I stood up in court and I said, yes, your honor, I plead no contest, which in, in law is basically saying you're guilty. Yeah, you're not saying guilty. I'm saying I, I, I'm not. I'm pleading on contest. I'm choosing not to fight the case. I'm allowing you to impose whatever you know punishment you you see fit for for this for this supposed crime. You know I'm not going to fight it. And um, I just heard my mom breaking down, and everybody's just confused and wondering what the hell is going on. And uh, so I take the deal. And. I remember being, like I said, I was in juvenile hall. Uh, I was 17 years old. I had just got caught up in some shit in there. It was this crazy situation. I was in the hall for about a few months. Uh, and the day after my 18th birthday, I, I turned 18. It was so surreal, so weird how it all took place. My 18th birthday, I was in juvenile hall. I was in the hall. It was late night, my cell door opened up and one of the guards came in with a hostess cupcake and a candle in it. He was one of the cool guards, you know, always was, you know, there for me. He's like, man, happy birthday. He handed me this little cupcake. And I was just like, you know, this is like big. I had been locked up a year. Cupcake was everything, right? Eating this shit up. And 
I go to sleep, I wake up, and the cell door opens up again, and they're like, hey, you're being transferred to Chino day after my 18th birthday. And uh, they chained me up, and the chains were different this time. You know, when you're in juvenile, they just throw your little cuffs on in front, and they take you where you need to go. And this time it was cuffs behind the back, chained around the waist, chain connected to the ankles, one chain going down the waist, ankles down to the legs. I'm shackled down. They redress me, put me in a different different suit and they take me to prison and uh i mean we can go crazy with stories on that that bus ride was fucking insane um talk about uh, insane a guy in a uh they put you on inside the bus they have one man cell uh one man's cages inside those buses there was this guy 5150 he's crazy as shit he's standing up in there chained up he's bashing his head against the gates he's bleeding and shit he's pulling his dick out he's pissing through the pissing through the gate trying to pee on people he's freaking out he's screaming everywhere there's guys behind me we're pulling up to chino state prison yeah baby i'm home oh yeah i'm sitting there like what the fuck you know i'm just taking it all in you're trying to keep that poker face you're trying to keep your you know keep looking like you know you ain't scared of shit i get to prison they take me out the bus strip me down naked they, I mean, this is just totally different, you know, than juvenile hall. Stripped me down completely naked, stripped everybody body down naked. It was a room as big as this, with about 60 guys in it, naked. And they leave you naked until alphabetically they call you out one by one to process you in at, you know, recept in R&R, &R, reception and release. Banks, <laughs> you're walking out naked. You've been in there with 60 dudes naked, and they finally give you a bed roll with some clothes in it, and they start asking you all these questions. Um, and I remember, he was like, you want a PC? I was like, what's, what's PC? Protective custody, you want PC? I see your your crime. I was like, what does that mean? I didn't, even know, <laughs> I didn't even know what it meant. What does that mean? He's like, well, that means that, you know, basically you don't feel comfortable being on a, you know, general population and, uh, you know, you wanna you wanna be, you know, separate. I was like, nah, I'm, I don't need that, I'm fine. And um, so they didn't put me on PC and they put, I'll go through this whole process. Anyways, 90 days of, of Chino start, I'm in there. I mean, I've, I've seen, I've watched riots. I watched, I go into the bathroom and brush my teeth. I see a dude in the corner of the shower, stabbed up, bleeding out. You just turn around and walk out like you didn't see it. You know, you, 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 two guys fighting on the yard. On the guard shoots one of the guys in the back with the mini 14 for not getting down. You know, you're just starting to get exposed to a lot of crazy shit, you know? And um, so I'm thinking to myself, just get through the 90 days, just get through the 90 days. And I eventually get interviewed by the psychologist and the counselor. And they interview you one by one, not together. And literally walking out of both of those rooms, they both said the same thing. I don't know why the fuck you're here. I read your case file, this shit don't make no sense. I can see right through this case, like you should not be here. The DNA, the inconsistency of the girl's statements, the lack of investigation into your case, it makes no sense. No priors, no record, no nothing. I don't know why you're here. And I'm, and they said, I'm, you know, both of them, I'm going to recommend the lowest that I can recommend, which is the felony probation. I wish that I can do less. I wish that I can say you don't deserve any of it. Literally from each, from both of them, one by one. And I remember hearing that and I'm just being so overjoyed to hear somebody finally in this situation that knows about law, that's part of this whole system, to finally break cold and go, you're innocent. I, I didn't hear it for a whole year. No, everybody act like, you know, just let let the just let it play its way out, play its way out. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. So to hear that was so rejoiceful. I remember um, during that 90 day stay in prison, we couldn't have any contact or phone calls with the outside world. No visits, no phone calls. Why? They shut it all down. During the 90 day observation, it's kind of like, you know, you're in Chino and you don't get the, you're here on an observation. You're not here as a, as a full-time resident. So you don't get the, I guess the benefits of a. Is there cameras inside the cells or anything when they're observing? Not, you just, you just don't get visits from, you just can't get a physical visit and you can't make phone calls. I don't know why it's like that. How is that though? When you plead no contest, basically admitting your guilt, how does that then think of your mum? Because part of you would think, part of you probably thought, did I do it? Did you ever think that? Did I do it? Because everything got turned against you, mm -hmm. where you start thinking, mm -hmm. maybe, possibly. But how is that when you plead it and your mum breaks your heart? Because then your mum and dad should, in life should basically die for you. 
mm-hmm. no matter what you fucking do. Listen, that's probably one of the worst things you can do, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. how hard is that for then your mum possibly getting question marks when maybe my son is a rapist? Yeah. Did you feel that, or did she always have your back? I never felt that for my mom. Yeah. My mom is uh, a strong a uh, Christian woman and she raised us in a church, you know, whether we wanted to be there or not, you, you go into church, you go to Sunday school and you go to choir rehearsal. So we were at church three times a week. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, and uh, we never, you know, she never let girls come over to the house. She never let us, you know, go out on, you know, dates at night. Like, she was very strict. We had a very strict household, you know, um, right before I got locked up was the first time she ever let me throw a party. It was a 4th of July party with girls. And I got locked up July uh, 8th, four days later. Um, so I, I, I never, I think the only time she ever really questioned me was the first time we had ever talked about it. The first visit she came to see me at Juvenile Hall, that's when she really like looked at me and she was like, what the, you know, you didn't tell me everything. And after that, it was like, it, it, I, we never, I don't, she never showed me that she ever felt that mm-hmm. this was real. Um, and I never sat, you know, it's funny. I never had the thoughts in my head of, damn, did I, did I do something? Did I do this? I never felt that. But what I, what I can tell you, I felt was my mind started to fuck with me in a way of, I started thinking that everybody has something to do with this. Even my mom had something to do with this. How is she letting this happen? How is she letting me stay in this jail for so long? How is my dad? You know, I'm, 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 I'm questioning everybody now because the paranoia is setting in because the, the, the stress and the nervousness and the, the feeling of being alone and being taken away from the world and everything that you know to be true. And the only thing that's now, you know, here is you dealing with this situation and everyone around you that can't do anything about it. And you start to question, why can't you do anything about it? Why am I still in here? And so you start to, you start to, you know, really question everybody and question, you know, your lawyer. Is she she snaking me, you know? And then you got to snap yourself out of that because, you know, none of those folks are, you know, my my mom obviously had nothing to do with it. But it's just, I think it's just the mind game. That's what it takes you, man. It takes you to, you know, you're in that cell and that cell will play with your mind in a way that you never could imagine, you know? And, um, but no, I never, I never, I never got to a point where I knew, where I felt like, you know, did I do this? Or did I Fuck that. I never, <laughs> yeah. I never, but you know what I'm saying is that sometimes the mind can play tricks because people are telling you that much, take deals, yeah. admit this, admit this. Yeah. And then you eventually admit it. And then you could possibly question it, especially with all the pressures and the stresses. Yeah. What happens then within the 90 days? So I got that favorable report. And since I couldn't contact my mom anyway, I, I, I could write her a letter. So I wrote this letter and I'm, I'm in the letter. Mom, we got it. We got the favorable report. I'm hitting it in big letters, all caps, exclamation marks, smiley faces. I'm coming home in a matter of this many days. We got it. Here we go. I'm so happy. Yada, yada, yada. I'm taking my lemons and I'm trying to make lemonade. It's felony probation. It's this, it's that. But I'm getting out of jail. Like I'm getting out of this. I'll take that at this point. And so I'm very happy to, to get that report. I finish my 90 days, they send me back to court. I go back to court and I get in front of the judge and I presented the judge with a stack of character letters from, you know, ministers and family members and friends and teachers and just people who could speak on my behalf of who I am as a person. I mean, a stack, it probably took you a day to read them. The judge goes, okay, um, I see you got some uh, character letters. I'm gonna go back in the chambers and read these real quick and then I'll come right back. It came back in about three to five minutes. And I knew it. I just, <laughs> he didn't read shit. I knew, <laughs> I, I knew he didn't read shit. I was like, this dude went and took a piss real quick yeah. and came right back. Like, I knew he didn't read anything. And he came back and he said, uh, <clears throat> uh, would the mother of the, the, the victim like to get up and, and say a few words? And man, she got up and, and uh, you know, those, you know, when you, I mean, you're you're a monster. You're, you're this. You're that. You don't deserve this deal. You should be getting more time. You you took advantage of my daughter. You took her innocence. You didn't give her a choice when she wanted to lose her virginity. You're evil. Yada yada yada. I mean, I'm I got family in there. I got friends in there. I got everyone's in there. I people I don't know in there. Random people waiting for the next court. You know their court case, and it's just 
ah, man, oh, there's nothing like uh, sitting there hearing something like that. It's one thing I, you know, I always, one thing I used to think to myself when you when you, when you think like, you know, when your mind plays tricks on you is, I always thought to myself like, I, I don't, you know, I, I've never committed a crime. I never want to be in jail, but, but fuck, I wish I was in here for at least something else. Like, like, you know, even if I did do it or didn't do it, like it would be, it would be a lot easier for me to deal with if it wasn't rape, if it wasn't having to be accused of something, like the worst fucking thing that you can do, you know, to be accused of that. Um, and then to have someone be in your face, looking at you, telling you this stuff and you can't say nothing, you can't defend yourself. You can't say, well, what about the DNA? What about this? What about, you just gotta sit there and take it. Why would she like to speak? Because it was sentencing. And I guess the judge felt like during sentencing that uh, the mom should have a word. So this was after the 90 days. You're going for 90 days. You're yep. kind of assessed on things. And then they sent you after the 90 days. To determine whether I'm getting that felony probation, three years or six years. So she was saying you took her virginity? She said, oh, you took my daughter's, you know, her, her innocence, her virginity. You didn't give her a chance. I mean, every single thing you could think of, she's saying it to me. She finishes talking. And she sits back down and judge goes, thank you. Appreciate your words. I'm going to sentence you to six years straight up, just like that. And gave me the high term of six years. Didn't explain why. No reasoning, no justification. Like I said, I've never been locked up. No priors, no nothing. He gave me the higher term of six years. And it was it was ordered up like he was in a, in a drive through at a fast food restaurant. It was that quick. And I remember my look. <laughs> My lawyer um, plan is, you know, at the time I believed her. When I got back to my cell, I looked at it again, just played this whole thing of she was shocked. <gasps> oh, my God. You know, <laughs> <sighs> throws her pen down. <gasps> and you just hear everybody in there, in there crying and just I'm crying. I'm, You know what? Actually, I wasn't. <laughs> I was crying like I had some tears in my eyes. I'll be honest. When I got when he says six years. And they wrote, they were, they were started, you know, giving you all the conditions. Like once they give you the sentence, then they start saying, you know, this time is going to run and concurrent with the time served and yada, yada, yada. And they start talking all the sideways stuff. And, you know, you'll be rep you know, five, five years felony probation. You'll be registered sex offender for the rest of your life. But do you understand? They're giving you all these yes, no, yes, no, yes, no questions. I remember smiling, man. I started laughing. Like I had a fucking freak out. Like I, I just was like. <laughs> <laughs> fuck I was like <laughs> man and, and 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 the judge hit the thing boom and I and I just looked back at my mom and they're crying I was like I love y'all man this, <laughs> this is crazy and they just walked me out of the courtroom all I could do was just laugh I just laughed man. after a year of fighting that case a year of being in jail no evidence no DNA six inc different stories all everything you need to prove that I was innocent and no one gave a fuck about it and the judge gave me the higher term of six years, not the felony probation, not just three years. Let me give you six years. 18 years old. I just laughed, man. Once I got out of the courtroom, that's when I started fucking crying. I got back into the holding cell. And uh, it's crazy because the holding cell, you know, in, in L.A., L.A. County is fucking ruthless, right? When you're in jail, jail is ruthless. You're going to fight. I don't care who you are. You're going to fight. You're going to have some fights. You're going to be in riots. You're going to get tested. Somebody going to want to test you. It's just how it is in there. And uh, the one of the scariest places to be is in the holding cell at the courthouse because you're in there with potentially your enemies from the same neighborhood. You're in there with the person that you're going against in court, whatever. So a lot of times dudes get smashed in that holding cell at the court office. So a lot of guys get to court and that, that tank's kind of quiet because everybody's in there like, you know, like wondering, like, is this shit going to pop off? So every time I went to court, I was always kind of nervous. I didn't have beef with nobody, but there was always that fear of someone knowing my case or what I was in there for. And, you know, anything could happen at any moment. So I was always on guard. I was not on any kind of fucking guard after he gave me the sentence. I remember going back to that holding cell. All them dudes were in there and I, I went in there and I sat down and I was just gone and I was just. I had tears in my eye, my legs were tapping, my hands were shaking. I'm I'm like feeling like I'm about to pass out. And all I could think about was trying to add up how much time I had left. I was just like, okay, fuck. All right, man, I, I've been in for a year and they said six years, I gotta do 85% of that. I carry two, three, four, five years, two months. 
I got to do four more years, four years and two more months to go. And I just sat there. And I remember telling the dude, there was one guy, I didn't even know him. He said, what'd they do, man? I said, they must have sentenced you. What happened? And I was like, he gave me six years. He was like, oh, shit, man, that ain't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I just sat there and I'm just like, this, this world is fucking crazy. Like, I'm just thinking, like, where am I? This shit just don't make sense, man. And I'm, yeah, man, and I have four more years to go. And uh, here's the fuck, here's all of us fuck. Here's the most, here's the, the my lawyer was like, we're gonna, we're gonna fix this. We're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna file a, uh, a motion for uh, remodification of sentencing. This is outrageous. We're gonna fix this. Don't you worry. And I got sent back to prison, and now I'm sentenced. So now I'm going through the process of, of, um, uh, in, uh, when you go through, uh, um, uh, they call it, um, uh, it's a point system, basically, to, to determine on what level of security, uh, of, of, of maximum security, of minimum security you should go on. Um, and um, while I'm in there waiting to be told, you know, where I'm going to go, I get a letter in the mail from my lawyer. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Um, hope you're OK. I'm working on your remodification of sentencing. Um, I feel good about it. But in order for us to do this, um, you, you need to have an appellate attorney to help you with this. We've got an appellate attorney in our office uh, who's going to help. So I need you to sign this form. It's going to release me as your lawyer. And then we're going to bring this guy on to help you remodify your sentencing. I signed the paperwork, send it back out, and she disappeared. To this day, I never heard from that lawyer again. Really, she knew? My mom never heard from her. She, she's a judge in L.A. She's a judge to this day right now. And I'm... I mean, my mom never heard from her again. I never heard from her again. Her office ended up closing. The number ended up shutting off. Um, I guess, you know, she became a judge. And um, the the appellate attorney that she said was going to take over, I never, I don't know who this person is, never met him, never talked to him. It was over. It was it. And I was, we were stuck. So when, you know, when you say like, well, you know, why weren't you screaming and, and yelling for help or, you know, trying to, to who? You know, that was it. My mom sold the house, sold the car, gave up all she had for this lawyer. She was done. She was cooked. They didn't have nothing else. Don't worry down the conspiracy route, but what do you think of people getting sacrificed for their own gain? What do you mean? That people get through under the bus. Okay, you get a promotion. Give me a ham, ham, ham. Secret handshake society. Yeah. Where you get a promotion, but we need something from you where people are getting used. Yeah. People's lives are getting destroyed for the own wicked games of whatever the society they're in. Yeah, man. You know, I've 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 had the unfortunate opportunity to see the worst in the human spirit. And I've had the opportunity to see some of the best. And uh I just can't fathom the idea of taking on the responsibility of or telling someone that you're taking on the responsibility of trying to protect their freedom. But during that, you see an opportunity for your own personal gain. And that personal gain outweighs the work at hand, the promise that you've made, the commitments that you've put in front of you. You know, I'm all for winning. Um, but at the, you know, at the at the hands of of someone losing their entire life and their future, um, at the hands of a family being crumbled. Um, at the hands of a mother losing her son. Uh, I just can't understand how people could have, who could have that in them, could sleep at night, wake up and just go on about their day, um, knowing that they're, they're, they're taking people's money and doing the exact opposite of what you said you would do. I know that it exists. I've, I've experienced it. My lawyer never wanted to fight my case never went to the crime scene, never interviewed any of the people, never talked to me and really asked me all the questions that she should ask me. And, um, and yeah, she's a judge now. She's a judge, man. And I don't, I don't, I haven't talked to her. I haven't seen her face. Uh, I don't know, you know, you know, I think there was a point in time where, you know, my my story was on 60 Minutes uh, when I was initially exonerated and 60 Minutes made many attempts to try to contact her and 
get her side of the story and get her involved. And she basically, you know, denied it. And I think that she made some excuse about uh, attorney client privilege. And I was like, fuck, I'll give you all the privilege you want. You come on tell us what happened, you know, and, and just disappeared basically. But I mean, we gave her a bunch of sentimental stuff. Like I, all the recruiting letter stuff that I was telling you that I was getting from, from, I gave, I told my mom to round up as much recruitment mail that she could to show the judge um, and to give it to the lawyer. The lawyer never gave it to the judge and we never got it back. So all of my recruiting letters like to this day are gone. I don't have none of that stuff as memories of of my past of football. Um, But yeah, man, people are fucking sick. And I I mean, if you would have asked me about this years ago, I would have, I would have never believed that it could, it could happen. You asked me about it today. I'm very jaded and I'm fully aware of how sick and cruel people can be. Like I've, I've seen it. I've seen the worst of people. What was the worst part about it? Oh, you know, that's really hard. There's so many bad experiences. I went through so much. I went through a lot. I've been able to, you know, process it and, I'm able to talk about a lot of it now. There's spaces I don't talk about. There's things I don't talk about. I think the worst part of it all is the waiting game. The, um, the, the, the unknowingness of what's going to happen to you when you fight in that case. I think being in limbo is the hardest thing of it all. Um, you know, serving a sentence for something you didn't do is horrible. It's bad. Prison's horrible. Prison's bad. Fighting the conditions, the, I can give you stories for days, five years worth of stories. But I think what hurts the most is being in prison for, or being in jail for something you didn't do and having to show up in front of the judge every single day and you have this hope, you've been praying to God, you've been overloading prayer, that this all is you know removed from your life and every time you show up, it gets worse. It gets worse, it gets worse, it gets worse. It gets worse up until a point to where you just, you're not going home. I think that to me was the worst experience. Just having your heart ripped out of your chest every fucking time you go to court and you think that they're going to do the right thing. You think that someone's going to step forward and come, you know, and, and, and say the right thing or do the right thing. It just doesn't happen. Um, you really, you lose a sense of trust, uh, in humans, you know, you lose trust, you lose belief, you lose faith in people. Um, I, you know, like I said, I, I, I don't, I don't think I could put one thing over the other. But if I, if I, if I had to, it, it'd be the, the, the whole process of, of fighting the case. What something was that? I didn't do. How was that feeling? though? like you say, it's the worst thing you came in prison for is fucking pedophilia or rape. Yeah. Did people know what you were in for? Did uh, they make the media or anything? Yeah. So when I was in juvenile hall, your, your what you're in there for is pretty much wide open. Juvenile hall is very relaxed. The The guards have a clipboard with your name and it literally has the case next to it. And they'll sit the clipboard on the table and walk away. And we get the clipboard, we looking at it and we talking, well, you ain't here for this. And then, you know, so in at that level, everyone knows everything. Uh, when you get to prison in California, it, it changes um, and it's, it's different by the race of, 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 you know, your color. If, if you're a Hispanic or you're a white, they're going to want to see your paperwork from the fucking gate before you get into the prison. There's somebody, what's up on me? Let me see it. They want to know what you're in there for. Um, for blacks in prison in California, at least during my time when I was there, it's, it was more of a don't ask, don't tell. And as long as you're not drawing attention to yourself, we won't really worry about what you're in here for unless you got a high profile case or unless someone does know you and they come and bring it up to everybody else and we can't ignore it and we got to deal with it. Um, for me, because my paperwork was not asked for, um, I actually created a whole different story about why I was in jail. You know, if I was ever asked, I was telling people I was in there for a home invasion that a, a buddy of mine committed, but the, uh, it, it was a whole story. A friend of mine committed a home invasion on a guy that we all knew. The guy knew who did it and he threw a bunch of names into the pot. I was one of those names. I took the rap from my homeboy. I'm here now. That was my story. Um, only one time there was one occasion I was locked up probably, I was three years into my five year sentence and um, 
You know, when you're in prison in California, you got to roll with somebody. You can't roll solo. Uh, so even if you're not a gang member, then you're going to break you down to your city. So when you come in there, uh, they press you real hard. Somebody going to run up on you. Where the, where the fuck you from? You know, it's like real aggressive. You know, and if you're not from somewhere, what city are you from? I'm from Long Beach. Okay, well, then you got to answer to the people from Long Beach. They deal with you. I was, I had, I won't say connections, but before I got to prison, I already knew, like, I'm my, I was born and raised in Long Beach. Long Beach is the hood. It's the ghetto. It's gang related. Um, and um, we had, I had, a, so like, family members friends of family members that were in prison. So I was able to kind of reach out to a few people before I had even got there to like let them, you know, know that I, this was happening, I was showing up. So by the time I got to prison, I actually had a few people that were already aware of who I was, but in my favor, you know, looking out and stuff like that. Um, on one occasion, I was gonna say it was uh, three years in, I was on a maximum security, it was on level three, and there was a guy that was part of the Long Beach car and he was going home. He was paroling. And the day before he paroled, I was in my cell doing some shit. I, my cell door opened up and he walked in <clears throat> and he closed the cell door behind him. And I'm like, what's going, you know, he was my, he was my guy. He was cool. We always, you know, we ate together. We rapped together. We played dominoes together. So he was cool. He closed the cell door and he said, look, man, um, I just want you to know this whole time like I, I know what you in here for like I know your situation and uh you know I think it's pretty fucked up that you you know you've been walking around here and you, you know you're not letting people know what the situation is because that can get us all in the wreck that we you know we got you with us we carrying you around and you know you got this on your, your jacket I didn't already asked a few people you know a few other people about you on the streets they validated that your shit is bullshit and that you shouldn't be in there and that that whole thing was a setup. So I understand, but I just want you to know if I was somebody else and somebody else found this out, this shit could have went a whole different way. Now he's basically face to face with me telling me this, I, you know, and, and when he told me, you know, I, I wasn't worried about him. He was half my size. Like if he would went down in there, I would have fucking destroyed him and there was no problem. But, you know, he could easily go and spread the word and make it something crazier. Um, that was the only time I was ever kind of pressed about what I was in there for. Other than that, nobody really asked me. There was one other instance where I could have, where uh, my situation could have been really bad, but I really think that uh, my higher power, and I'm, I'm speaking on God, there were really a lot of instances with, instances of, of during my incarceration where I feel like there was a divine intervention taking place in my life. I'm a firm believer. They did. Absolute. Listen, I'm telling you one day when I got to Chino State Prison, they put me in this dorm, uh, this uh, gymnasium that had been converted into a dorm, this big ass basketball gym. They had three tier bunks, two tier bunks, which means it was bunk beds was three levels. You know what I mean? They had a tower up at the top with the mini 14, a guard up there hanging a gun out 24 seven. There was spray paint on the walls that says there will be no warning shots. Like they're going to just shoot. You start fighting. They're just going to let it off. And um, when I got into this, when I got into this, this uh, dorm, uh, I had no idea that they hand the paperwork over to inmates who are controlling the intake of the dorm, you know, to give all the jobs to the inmates. So I'm in there, I'm fixing my bed up, you know, I'm guys walking up to me, you know, talking to me and stuff like that. I'm just getting to prison for the first time, man. I don't know what prison is like. And as I'm fixing my bed, this dude walks up to me. And he's like, what's up? What's up, bro? What's going on? He's talking to me. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, um, you know, uh, I want to say his name, put his name out there, but he's like, you know, uh, you know, X. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. He's like, yeah, it's my crime. Me. It's my cousin. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. And the guy he was referring to, we were in juvenile hall together. We went to high school together. He was one of my homeboys for many years. He went to prison for a whole lot of time and he was somewhere else. They were crying me for an attempted murder, carjacking, some other shit like that. And he was like, uh, he was like, um, yeah, man, that's my crime. My cousin, man, he told me about you, bro. Like, I know, don't, you know, don't trip. He's like, you know what else? I want to tell you something. And he leaned in. He said, uh, 
you know, I, I just want you to know, I take care of all our paperwork up front and I got yours. I, I went on and pushed it and processed it for you. So ain't nobody going to see that. And I'm thinking to myself, had all these people in prison that could be doing the paperwork that could be processing people in. It happened to be somebody who knew me and who really knew what the situation was. It could have been totally different. I could have been blindsided easily, easily. What's the worst thing you've seen in prison? I think I mentioned it. Uh, worst thing I ever seen in prison was was going to the in Chino, going to the bathroom to brush my teeth in the morning. A little towel thrown over my shoulder, toothbrush in my ear. Got my toothpaste in my hand, some soap bars. I'm walking to the thing. I'm walking to the bathroom. I walk in there. As soon as I walk in, I look to my left. The showers are right here. The sinks are over here, and it's split by a wall. I look over, right over the bottom, there's a dude sitting there in the corner. He's stabbed up. He just bleeds. You just see a drain of blood just going into the drains. And he's out. He just turn around, walk the fuck up out of there. <laughs> you just turn around, you walk out, and you get on your bunk. Is he dead? Uh, no, he was not dead. But he was he was airlifted out. He was airlifted out. But, I mean, you you literally, you you, you know, you, you can't show anything. You just walk out, and then you just start seeing everybody one by one kind of sitting on their bunks. And then, you know, when everybody's kind of sitting down, cleared out the way that something's going on, you know, I think that was one of the worst situations. I mean, other than that, just uh, the inhumane experiences dealing with guards and searches and, you know, those 3 a.m. searches where they come in, busting up the shit and stripping you naked and making you sit on infested floors without clothes on and making you be in rooms with 100 guys in a room that could probably only fit 60, you know, and you in there, you know, just waiting to be let out while they're searching everything. You know, uh, riots. I've been in riots. I've, I've been stabbed in riots. I, uh, fights. You know, I had a lot of fights. And you get kind of get used to that stuff. Um, but I would definitely say just the 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 wide eyed awakening of how serious, how violent prison can be, especially only being there for a few weeks. I was in Chino on a ninety day observation, watching a, a dude get airlifted out. You know what I'm saying? So you're in there six years. Obviously, before people get out of prison, they can't wait to get out. How was your mindset with it coming out? No football career, convicted rapist. How was your mindset going out? Were you glad to get out or Dude. were you just scared of the unknown? Determined. Absolutely determined. When I was in prison, I went through I went through uh, many different phases. Uh, my first phase was rage. After I was sentenced, I just said, fuck it. I was mad. I was angry. Angry at the world, angry at every single person I could think of, a little bit of anger to my family, everybody. I just had this chip on my shoulder. Uh, I had four years to go, and so I was just very, very angry. Um, and after a few months, I I, uh, I felt like I had this epiphany, this eye-opening uh, experience in my life where um, and they kind of tried to portray it in the film. Um, I, I was in my cell one day. And um, there was this, you know, they gave you these tiny little windows in there. And I remember the window light was just kind of peering through real strong. And um, so I walked over to the window and the lights hitting the sun is just hitting me in the face. And I'm sitting there just kind of looking up, looking over my life and my in my in my mind. And a voice just started talking to me. And uh, it, it just says uh, but the voice was like, you know, you you got to stop uh, trying to be in control over things you can't control. Uh, and I'm not in control over the things that I'm fighting to be in control of. This entire time I've been trying to change things that I could not change. Um, and I had to realize that what I was doing to myself with the rage and the anger, uh, I was I was killing myself and I was destroying myself. I, I found myself doing the job for the people that put me behind bars, living how I was living, thinking the way that I was thinking. Um, and just, it, it was weird. It was kind of a, a turn of events for me where I, it was almost like a deep breath and and, and a, a, a change of mind of, let me start focusing on what I can't control uh, in a very uncontrolled situation. And what I can control is my emotions, first and foremost. You know how I uh, think about a situation, how I allow a situation to affect me, and what I choose to do as a response to the situation. All three of those were always in my control. 
what was going on in my life may have been uncontrolled. Um, but the emotion that I was applying to it was always in my control. And I was applying all the wrong emotions, which in turn was breaking me down inside, changing me as a person, changing my spirit, changing my beliefs, changing my my beliefs in, in God and in, in people and in, in everything. And I had to let that go. Not only let that go, but I had to let go of the past of things that I was hanging on to so much that I couldn't wait to get back to because I had so much time to get through. And the more I focus on what what was and what no longer is, it was literally just driving me crazy. I would have never made it out of there. I would have never I would start. I mean, I was getting involved in shit in there that I shouldn't have got involved in, you know, and it was just because it was just a whatever, a, a whatever mentality. Um, but I had this, I had this epiphany, you know, of, of, of wanting more for myself, realizing that if there was anything that was going to change, it would have to start with me first and the change was going to come from me. Would you ever say that you do? Never. No, I never had an idea of, I didn't want to be here anymore, uh, physically. Like I wanted to end my life. Um, and that, that, you know, that, and no offense to anybody who's ever experienced those emotions. I've done life coaching with folks who have and who are dealing with those types of thoughts and feelings. But me personally, I never thought about that. I never, and I, I don't know if it was just how I was raised with my mom and my family. I don't know if it was the competitiveness of sports and football that taught me to, you know, get hit and get the fuck back up and keep going. But there was always this drive in me that kept trying to figure out the puzzle. I was more fascinated with trying to figure it out than, than not, figure out it, you know, figure it out at all. Um, I never, I, I'm too afraid to try to kill myself. I, I, I couldn't do it. I, I just, that's not something I can do. I, I don't think I could ever do some shit like that. But, um, um, but I, I, I did, I did get, uh, I did get really off course in my life, you know, because of what I went through and because of what I was experiencing. Um, I met my mentor when I was in juvenile hall fighting the case. Our mentor was his teacher uh, at the juvenile hall. And I, I can't even tell you what subject he taught because you go into his class and his focus was um, discovering who the real you is, thinking outside of the box, challenging my mind in ways that had never been challenged before. Um, you know, he would give me literature to read and different things to consider and think about and different ways to uh, work on my spirituality and things of that nature. Uh, it's crazy because the first 14 days that I was incarcerated, um, I didn't come, like I said, I didn't come out of my cell. I lost 14 pounds. I wasn't eating the food. I got real sick. They took me to the infirmary a few times. I wasn't interacting with anybody. I wasn't talking to anybody. And um, they didn't know what to do with me. One day my cell door opened up, this just dude came in he wasn't one of the guards he was in plain clothes he had these glasses on he, um, he was you know straight back upright and he was very confident you could just feel his energy just a different energy that you, you don't really see in people and he walked into the room my cell and he surveyed the cell and he looked at me and looked me up and down and he didn't say anything and i'm just looking at this man and he came in he sat next to me on the bed and he put his hands in his laps like this and he looked at me and he just kind of looked up and down and then finally he spoke. He said, you know what, young man, I don't know what it is you're going through, uh, but you're going to have to let this go. And um, I remember instantly hearing this, and the first thoughts in my head was, you know, how could I let this go? What are you talking about? Like, I'm in the midst of the storm. I am in the eye of the storm. And here's this random guy coming into my cell saying, you got to let it go. And I didn't understand what he meant by that, you know. And But at the same time, there was something internally within me that I felt connected to what he said. I began to cry and I would start sobbing and there was something that resonated with what he said. I just didn't understand it in my mind yet what he was saying. And uh, later I would start working with him day in and day out on just um, my spirituality, on my my emotions, on, uh, you know, self-discovery, self-realization, self-love, um, forgiveness and all these different things of that nature. And it, it really helped me as I was fighting my case, it was, I felt like he was empowering me, building me up with tools of survival. And there was a point in time where I felt like what he was doing to me was preparing for me to get out of prison, fight this case, win, and then have this better life. And I would, I, I, I later realized that he was actually preparing for me to 
uh, to go to prison. He was preparing me to be prepared for the worst. And, and when I got sentenced, I lost sight of all of that. And now here's another uh, divine intervention. I feel like a you know, higher power was at work. When I got sentenced, I went into a rage and I just let go of everything that he taught me. And I kid you not, one day I was in jail and I got a letter in the mail from him. I was in prison. And he said, I just wanted to write you because I, there's something in my mind that's telling me that you've fallen off course from your teachings. You've fallen off, you've fallen off from where we, where we, where we left off. And I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to write you and to remind you of, of, uh, who you are, uh, where you are and what you can do in this moment. And it was kind of this, uh, um, it was at the right time. It was very timely. It was almost too timely. It was weird to get that letter and, you know, reading it while angry and just kind of losing all the anger and just uh, uh, having this self-reflective uh, moment. But that really helped me. And then, like I said, I, I had this epiphany and then that really got me on my focus. So right after that, I just started getting into like what I could control. So I, I started reading like crazy. I got into a lot of psychology and sociology. I got into a lot of Afrocentricity studies under Molifi Kite Asante. I got into... Um, I read the dictionary probably three or four times. I read the thesaurus three or four times. I would take the dictionary and take words out of them and one by one, write them down and then write the definition. I would self-taught, you know, I, I learned how to speak. I would go out into the, out into the yard in prison and start using big ass words on people. And they didn't know what the hell I was saying. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it, 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 I took the time to not sit in anger, uh, but to, uh, work harder for me than anybody else could work harder for me because I know at the end of the day what I want for me, nobody else could ever want it for me more than what I want. So in order for me to get it, I had to be fully engaged and, and fully about that life, which was getting back home, becoming free, moving on with my life and in and, and the best way possible, um, rising above the accusations, being better than what I was being labeled and accused of, um, and ultimately um, uh discovering the spiritual side of me, my journey towards enlightenment. What was it like getting out? Uh, very naive. <laughs> I was very naive. I, when I, right before I paroled from prison, um, I reached out to my old high school football coach who was now the head coach for a junior college. And I told him that when I got out of prison, I wanted to play football still. And he said, well, I'm, I'm coaching at this little JC, you know, we love to have you. And he actually got involved in enrolling me into college before I even got out of prison. Uh, he sent me the playbook uh, in prison. Uh, so I'm sitting there reading football playbooks and, and you know, I'm getting in, filling all the paperwork to get enrolled. And I got out of prison, I think on a Wednesday, August 29, 2007, it could be Wednesday. Uh, but I know that weekend I had a football game, like a few days out of prison and uh, I like you, know, you talk about a fucking bat out of hell. I was I was trying to kill people on that field. Like I mean, everything there's this this five years of pent up everything. Now I'm now I got a helmet on with some shoulder pads. I'm <laughs> you know I'm flying around hitting people and you know. But the naive part was I, I thought that what I was going to do was get out of prison, get into school, um, and just try and move forward as if you know the the worst was behind me. I got out of prison and um, I did exactly that. And within a couple months, California implemented a new law that required all 290 registrants, which are sex offenders, uh, to wear a GPS on their ankle for the duration of their parole sentence. Um, I had a maximum parole sentence of five years. So they, within a few months of being out, they fitted me with this giant ankle bracelet. And now I had a curfew I couldn't live within 2,000 feet of any school or park. I had to register as a sex offender wherever I lived. Um, I couldn't play football because it would could get tampered or pulled and broken, and I would be an automatic violation of parole. Um, I couldn't be on school campuses, none of that type of stuff. So it, it really, um, you know, my life, I used to have these waves where as soon as I thought that, you know, the worst was over, boom, it hit me again. I'm surprised they even give you a chance, though, by being a convicted rapist. That's a good coach, that, that he's believed in you. Yeah, man. When, do you know what I mean? Because everybody, no matter what you say at that point, you know yourself, you've admitted that people thinking fucking deserves it. You know, nobody uh, you know, I that I know of believed this mm -hmm. story about what happened. 
you know, no one believes it. We and I and I can't speak for everybody in my city, but what I can say is that growing up in the nineties, in the early two thousands, as a young teen in my neighborhood, you never heard about rape. No one was taking advantage of females. The concept of rape was not in our black neighborhood. Like it, it no one was trying to take anything from anybody. It, so, and then for it, me to be accused of it, um, it, it, it didn't make sense. Who, uh, who was making the accusation really didn't make sense. Everyone knew it was bullshit. Everybody knew it was bullshit. It didn't make sense. And then all the stories started coming out while I was locked up. And word is she going around saying it never happened. Word is, is they got this money from the lawsuit. Now they buying cars and buying clothes and they shopping sprees and doing this and doing that and speaking down on you. All these little things start coming out. And so everyone's learning over time. When did you find out they got the money? 1.5 million? I didn't find out until uh, the deposition. Uh, after the deposition, I think shortly after they, they settled. And I, I heard from that lawyer because that lawyer for the school district and he wasn't even supposed to do this. He wasn't supposed to stay in touch with me. He wasn't supposed to send me my case file. He wasn't supposed to do none of it. But he he took my calls. I called him from prison. He answered my calls from his his, uh, his law firm. I'd have questions about legal stuff. He'd answer them. Um, he, he let me know that they settled and that this was happening, that this was going on. Um, he, uh, he really, uh, he was like, he was godsend, man. He, he really opened my eyes to what was really going on behind my back that I didn't know. But yeah, I, that's what I learned from him that uh, that they settled for like one point five million dollars. And um, what you can throw your mind down, knowing that you're innocent, you've lost your football career. Your mum's went basically homeless by selling her house and her car yeah. to try and get you out of prison. Falsely accused by a couple of evil bastards. The mum seems as if she was involved in it because she's seen the pound signs. For me, I, I'll say it how it is. Fuck them both. Do you know what I'm saying? So, uh, how is that though when you've lost everything, but they've gained everything? Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't really. Uh, when I found out about her receiving the the settlement, I was already back on my spiritual journey. And I was already not allowed, trying my best not to allow things to affect me, um, but to be in control of my emotions, you know, and how I was allowing things to affect me. I don't think I really got too angry about that because at that point, nothing was a surprise. <laughs> you know, nothing was a surprise to me anymore. You could have said, yeah, man, and now she, you know, she got a house in clouds and living in space and whatever. Yeah, it makes sense. They put me in jail for something I didn't do. They took away my whole life. And again, it makes sense, you know. I think I was more so disappointed um, in the fact that I was learning so much about my case that I didn't know and how neglectful my lawyer actually was. That hurt me tremendously um, that, you know, we put so much faith and trust into somebody. And they literally just fucked us over, you know? I mean, so everything else was just kind of like icing on the cake. Oh, she got 1.5 million. Okay, well, makes sense. <laughs> you know? Why not, you know? Seems like a lot of money as well. Why 1.5 million? Why was it in the millions? I guess they were suing for a lot more. Um, and because my lawyer had neglected to... Uh, work with the lawyers of the school district they had no case because they couldn't get in touch with me they couldn't get a hold of me and and they couldn't get a hold of case files or anything because she was the attorney so they literally had nothing to go on uh, other than coming to depose me later on after I had already been sentenced um, you know what good is a deposition from a person who's been sentenced for a crime it really don't mean shit so you get out of prison after six years, you lose your football career again, you're on tag for five years, but your life takes a mad dramatic turn. Like you say, you talk about guidance and faith. We'll touch on later about how, why you went through this, but your life kind of goes mad again. You're probably just getting on with your life. Fuck it, you can't play football, you need to do something. You seem like a man who always finds something to replace whatever he's going through to try and kick on. Even though you probably defeated at a time when you were angry and 
full of violence and rage, which is understandable, but your life kind of went mad again because you got a, me- a Facebook request from your accuser. Yeah. yeah. What are you thinking then? How many years later was this? 10, 11 years? Not only did I get that Facebook request, but it was during a period of my life where uh, my life was just spiraling down and down and down. You know, prison is... Uh, Prison is, I don't wish prison on anybody. I think the experience, especially a California prison, and I've never been in jail nowhere else, so I can't speak on it. But from my personal experience, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Um, but I, but there is something about being back in the real world um, and um, being an, still being accused as a sex offender, being on a registry list as a registered sex offender. Um, having a, a skeleton in your closet of that magnitude that nobody else has. Uh, I couldn't find work. I couldn't find, a, you know, I couldn't get a job. No one wanted to hire me. And even if they did want to hire me, they would have to deal with the fact that I was on parole with a GPS ankle, a GPS monitoring device on my ankle and a parole officer that's going to, that's going to, you know, want to come visit the place every now and then. No one wanted to deal with that. Um, so it was, it was, it was, it was tough, you know, when, how can I say this? You know, when, when she contacted me on Facebook, I was, I was broke, <laughs> borderline homeless. Um, if it wasn't for a girl that I was dating at the time, I'd have nothing. Um, I was living with her. She was basically footing the bill for everything. Um, very, uh, a very uh, you know hard thing to deal with. As you know, if you consider yourself to be a man, a one that understands the the role of being a provider, um, to be in a a, a role reversed situation uh, was so hard. But yeah, I was. I was going through every single, you know, negative thing that you could think of, you know, at that time, uh, as far as not having work, as far as being a registered sex offender, as far as having no social life, as far as having no experiences, as far as losing 10 years of your life, like so many different things. So my life was, was, was on just, but my life was probably at that time that I got that request was at the, was at the lowest it could be. And, um, I was at home looking for a job online. I was on I was on all the different job sites, still trying to find work after three years of being on parole. I think it was three years or four years of being on parole, still trying to find work. And uh, I get bored. I'm like, fuck, you know, I'm filling out these applications. I'm bored. Let me take a break. And I decided to get on Facebook. I I remember at this time, Facebook was uh, Facebook was huge. And MySpace was still around. There was no Twitter and there was no. uh, uh, Instagram and all this other stuff. But Facebook was a thing. So I, I got on Facebook and when I opened up the site, I had a friend request and I clicked the box and it, the thing drops down and it was her, it was her face. It was her name. And I remember just slamming the laptop down and throw, I, I literally threw it across the room. I was just like, wow, woof. like it was that, that felt like, whoa, what the, like I got, you know, like I touched something I shouldn't have touched. They slammed it and I threw it across the thing. And I just sat there Staring out the window, I was sitting at the edge of my bed. I remember like it was yesterday. I sat at the edge of the bed and I'm staring out the window and I must have sat there frozen for several minutes, man, replaying my entire experience in jail. Flashbacks. I mean, it's just the craziest flashbacks. And, I, and my heart's racing. I'm, I'm freaking out. And then I had, and then I, and then it hit me. I was like, wait a minute. It's got to be somebody playing a fucking sick joke. It can't be her. This has to be somebody playing a joke. So I ring, got the laptop back. I popped it back open, and I'm looking at the 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 page, and um, and so I said, you know what? Uh, let me send a message. And I sent this message. I said, why would you friend request me? Exact words. Why would you friend request me? Just to see what if this person would say. Could you have went to prison for that because you were yes, supposed to have automatic violation of your parole? You're never supposed to come in contact with your supposed victim. Automatic violation. So I sent the message back thinking it wasn't her. Why would your friend request me? Just to see what the response was. And immediately, within seconds, a response came back. Um, I was hoping we could let bygones be bygones. Um, 
you know, um, I was looking at your pictures on Instagram, on uh, Facebook and, you know, you've grown up a lot and you look good. And, um, you know, I don't know if you've seen my pictures. What do you think about me? How do I look? You know, and it'd be nice if we get to, you know, hang out and connect sometime. And now I really thought there was some bullshit. I was, <laughs> I was like, there ain't no way. I was like, there's no, ain't no way this is her. No way. No way. So my next message was, you call me. I want to see who this is. And call me. Put my phone number there. And a few minutes, my phone started ringing. I stared at it for a bit. And uh, I answered it. And it was her. And uh, she said, hello. And I was just sat there in silence. It was just, I didn't say nothing for a few minutes. And I'm just, I'm listening. Like I'm in full paranoia mode. I'm listening to the phone. I'm listening into the background. I'm trying to hear noises. I'm trying to hear who else is on the phone. If I'm, is it three-way call? Is it, is it my, you know, is it, is it my pro officer with her? Like what's going on? Are they trying to set me up, put me back in prison? Like I'm, I'm really trying to figure out the situation. And uh, so she's like, hello, hello. And uh, finally, I, you know, we, yeah, what's up? Like, what's going on? Like, what, what's what's this? And literally, she just started flirting with me on the phone. Yeah, you know, I was, you know, I was thinking about you, and I didn't know if you was on Facebook, so I typed in your name, and you popped up, and like, wow, you, you know, you, you looking good, and you grown up, and I, uh, you know, have you seen my pictures? Like, what, do you, how you think I look? And um, you know, let's hang out sometime. You know, I, wherever you are, I love to see you. And I, you know, I. I don't have a car, but I, you know, I catch the bus to come see you or, you know, I can take a taxi or the train or, you know, let me know. Be, let's hang out, you know, and be, be fun. And, um, again, I'm in silence. I'm just sitting there and now I'm, I'm just, I don't believe anything. I don't think that I just don't think I, I'll tell you the honest. I thought that she was trying to set me up to be like, to be killed or something. I was like, maybe this is like some fucking setup where, you know, you try to get me somewhere and there's some dudes there, or, or maybe you're trying to set me up to go back to jail with my pro officer. And so I'm thinking to myself, like, you should hang this phone up. But then there's this other part of me that's saying, yo, you got to play chess and not checkers. Like, this is your opportunity to potentially shed light on what happened. If you can get her to come forward, then this is all done. So, I start playing chess. It's like, all right, well, uh, you know, I don't know about us hanging out right now, but you know, if you want to, maybe we can connect some time and talk. You know, I, I went through a lot of shit, you know, and, and I really need help getting my life back. You know, that, you know, you know, you and I both know what happened was, was fucked up. And, um, <laughs> her response was, uh, well, you know, we can hang out and kick it some time. And, you know, maybe I'll think about helping you. You know, all these hinting at this, basically hinting at trying to have sex with me. And I said, well, let me think about it. I got to really think about this. This is just a lot going on. And, and um, you know, I'll, I'll get back to you. I get off the phone. And for the next few weeks, she's texting me every single day, every single day, every few hours text. Hey, what's up? You free? Hey, what's going on? What you up to? You know, sending jokes and this and pictures and whatever. And uh, when we going to hang out? When we going to hang out? What's the, what day is this? What day is good? I mean, I'm getting these text messages from her every single day, like harassing me. But to a point to where you, you it just don't feel, it don't feel real. It's like you really are trying to set me up for something. And um, one day after me just kind of ignoring the text messages, she sent me a message and she said, you know what? It seems like you don't want to hang out. So maybe I'm not going to help you fix your life. If you don't want to hang out, then I ain't going to help. And I was, that's when I knew I had to do something. I'm like, okay, all right, she's going to disappear. I need to figure out something. Uh, so I reached out to my homeboy, um, and I, his dad had just became a private investigator. And I was saying, hey, and I told her, I finally broke silence. You know, only my, me and my, the girl I was dating at the time knew what was going on. I hadn't told my mom. I hadn't told nobody that this girl was contacting me. So I finally tell him. And he's like, look, bro, my dad, you know, talk to him. If anything, you know, he can get us in, get you in contact with somebody who can help you. So he gets me on the phone with his dad. I talk to his dad. His dad's like, well, just um, have her come to the office, the PI office, and, um, you know, it, and see if you can just get her to talk. Um, so I was like, all right, look, how about this? You, uh, I text her, you come, uh, come see me on my lunch break. I'm at work, you know, my job where I work at. 
and uh, we could talk during my lunch break and um, we're trying to figure this out. She said, okay, I'll be there. And um, to make a long story short, she, sh she showed up uh, the day that we had it all set up. Um, the private eye was there, um, his wife was there, um, and we basically set up his office uh, to where, you know, there was, uh, well, his, his office had certain cameras in certain places, but we start putting extras basically to kind of capture the whole, ex the whole thing. Um, and she showed up two days in a row, showed up the first day and it was just me and her talking initially. And, uh, it was mainly me expressing to her what I had been through, what I had gone through, what I had lost, uh, what I had experienced and the help that I needed. And her response was just like, well, you know, I went through things too, you know, like, you know, people were hating on me because I had all this money and I was buying all these cars and clothes and you know, I had a lot of haters and, you know, the, the DA's office was trying to get me to go and see the psychologists and the counselors and all this different stuff. And I, I just totally just uh, oblivious to what all I had just said to her about my life and loss, you know, and trying to match it with her experience with the $1.5 million and the help that the the district attorney's office was trying to get her mentally for opposed, supposedly being taken advantage of. All this was her hardship. Um, so I realized I wasn't getting anywhere with her on that front, you know, so I had to take it a different angle. So now I'm talking about like, how can, you know, let's, who can we talk to and get involved into helping me get my life back? And she's like, well, I don't want to talk to any police. I'm not going to talk to any lawyers. I'm not talking to nobody from a courtroom. You know, and I, I'm willing to help you, you know, however I can, but I don't want to have to pay back all that money that they gave me uh, because it's going to take a long time to pay it back. Um, um, you know, and so I was like, I'm thinking, I'm frantically thinking, I'm going, all right, um, would you talk to a private investigator? He's not involved with anybody. Maybe he could just give us some advice on how to go about it. And she was like, all right, yeah, I'll talk to a PR. That, that's cool. And, uh, she came back the next day. And now mind you, all of this, during all of this, she's flirting. Like she's flirting right in my face, you know, and, uh, I'm dealing with that. You know, I'm dealing with it poker face trying my best not to fucking go off and tell her how I really feel every moment of it uh so she come back the next day and um the PI the first time she came he was in a different room watching it on the monitor second time he was he uh she showed up she and I were in the office talking and then he acted as if he had just showed up to the office hey how you doing I'm private investigator you do you know, he shows up, he comes in, he sits down and he basically starts questioning both of us. And that questioning then led, you know, led to just questioning her and kind of asking her those hard hitting questions about did it happen and this, this and that. And she, she admitted to it. It never happened. She actually lost, she says she lost her virginity after this whole thing took place. Um, uh, she said that we were just being young and having fun and being dumb. And uh, one thing led to another and, you know, she, she made up, she says, I guess she, she made up a lie and, and then she blames it on the DA that the DA was asking her questions. And then the DA was trying to get more out of her and all this other stuff. Uh, it's all on YouTube. Her videos, you can find it on YouTube, you know, it's there. Um, the recantation video, but essentially, um, he was successful at getting her on tape, admitting that it never happened. It never took place. Um, and then a lot of truth to other things that even further proved that she made up the lie. And, uh, <laughs> I remember, man, this is a side, this is a side piece. We, she left that, she left the office. And I mean, when I talk about rejoicing, I was fucking crying. I'm rejoicing. We got this thing on tape. The D, the, the, the private eye, he's crying. His wife is crying. We all in there hugging each other. He's so hyped up. He yanks the the USB out of the camera, out of the the computer, before it finished downloading. <laughs> he turned. He 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 basically destroyed the the USB. So he's like, "Oh, he didn't finish downloading. Oh, let me put it back in." He puts it back in. Nothing shows up. He takes it out. He puts it back in. Nothing shows up. I'm sitting there watching from behind him, and I'm just like, "Do do 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 do." And he's sitting there like, click 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 click. Click, click, click. And he just stops. He goes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. 
I'm so sorry. And I'm like, no, no, you got to be kidding me. I push him out the way. I'm pushing it in. Put it, click, 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 click. His wife's trying. It's gone, bro. The footage is gone. I'm crying. He's crying. He's breaking down. And then he's like, starts, he's like, okay, calm down. We got to figure this out. And uh, we get in touch with this, uh, uh, what do you call those people for me to repair USB stuff? I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so we drive all the way to the city, this is little city somewhere, and he drops it off to this guy. And we're in a waiting game for like six days, six, seven days. Finally, the guy calls him back and said that he was able to recover 60% of the drive. Luckily, that 60% is all the recantation. Most of the first day was gone, which was me telling her about what I was going through and what I had experienced. There's pieces of it that was still there, but all that was gone. The second day was everything that we needed. He was able to recover that. And, um, I never shared him. I never told him about that. That's uh, I've always just never added that piece because I, always, I, I don't know, man, because people never ask, you know, they always ask about the, the, you know, the specifics of the case. They never really get into like the conversation of, of, you know, my experience. No one asked me about prison. No one asked me about what the, you know, life was like in there and what I, you know, this is always just a story, you know? Um, but yeah, man, I almost lost it. I lost it all. Um, so I get this to make a long story short, we recover it 60%. I get it. I take it from him. Give me this shit. I got it. And now I'm on this frantic search for an attorney who's going to help me appeal this case. I'm digging. I'm fouling. I'm emailing everybody. I'm calling everybody. And everybody's like ignoring it, not taking it serious. No one will take the calls. No one will answer. Um, I had reached out to an organization called the California Innocence Project. Now, I reached out to them initially while I was in prison. When I got my case file from the, the school district attorney, I had a... Uh, filed my own appeal i went back to be like so basically because we didn't have a lawyer or have can you appeal if you've admitted it though absolutely so you can still absolutely, appeal yeah even if you've admitted your guilt yeah you file what's called a writ of habeas corpus uh -huh. which is challenging the evidence of your of your case uh with some newly discovered evidence that wasn't presented in court before um so i went back i didn't have a lawyer so i we had a legal law, law library in the prison so I literally spent the next few months becoming a lawyer while I was in there learning the laws, you know, studying my case, staying up late nights, researching stuff. You know, everybody's in the yard. I'm sneaking to my room, my, my cell, and I'm digging through the paperwork when no one's around. And I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm asking the legal guys in the law library questions that like loosely kind of, you know, not letting you know what I'm looking for, but trying to figure out this and figure out that. And. Um, I, I put together on my own a valid, solid writ of habeas corpus that was actually uh, approved by the courts. Um, I went back to court to uh, basically contest the writ of habeas corpus and more corruption took place. While I was there, I got pulled into the court office. Now, mind you, you were supposed to, they gave me a court appointed attorney because I couldn't afford one. That court appointed attorney was supposed to see me prior to going to court to contest the writ of habeas corpus. I never saw this lawyer. He never showed up. I didn't see him until the, the until I was in the courtroom in front of the judge. Before the judge came out, he goes, hey, I'm your attorney. I'm, in, I'm inside the, the box. I'm like, all right, where you been? He was like, hey, I just want to let you know. If you if the judge approves this and you, you know, you do win your writ of habeas corpus, they're basically going to throw out your your conviction. They're going to retry you all over again. You're going to you know, going to give you a bail again. You're going to stay in jail and they're going to treat it all over again. You'll be facing life all over again. It's not as easy as you think. What? I was just about to say that's that. That's not true. You've already done your time. You've already done. That's not true. Why the fuck did they he say that? He said that to me. It wasn't true. Was that another? I don't know. I never saw the guy. He shows up. He whispers this in my ear. He tells me this. I had months left on my, on my sentence. I was out in probably less than a year. And I'm sitting here listening to this guy say this. The judge walks in. And he goes, all right, so uh, why are we here today, Mr. Banks? I stood up in the box and I said, Your Honor, I'd like to withdraw my writ of habeas corpus. <laughs> I apologize for wasting the court's time. Uh, please throw this out, and uh, I would like to finish out the rest of my sentence and go home. And he said, okay, granted. That was it. And I did not know that wasn't true. What's true is they can try to refile. More than likely, they will try and refile on you. But that doesn't mean that all the same rules apply um, the way that he tried to make it seem. It's different. I would have been able to go home. I would have paroled. 
you know. It, Did he not see the footage? The footage didn't exist at this time. This was when I first filed my own appeal. This was probably four years into my five year sentence, maybe four and a half years into my five year sentence. Mm -hmm. I filed my first appeal on my own and then I threw it out and I paroled home. And that's when all the other stuff started. Right, so this happen. was when you were in prison, you tried to do it all yourself? Yeah, try to do yeah, it Yeah, so myself. I'm thinking you've got the footage and you've tried to get money. No, by a lawyer. Right, 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 right. I filed my writ of habeas corpus on, the, uh, on the, the fact that my lawyer never used the DNA. So technically that was newly discovered evidence because it wasn't, it wasn't used. Mm -hmm. In the court's eyes, it's technically not newly discovered evidence because it did exist. My lawyer just did not use it. But it was enough for my writ to be heard in, in front of court. So once I threw that out, after hearing this guy tell me that, he disappears, the, the writ of habeas corpus disappears. I go back to, to jail and our prison and finish my sentence. Uh, and during that time, I had reached out to the California Innocence Project. They turned down my case because um, there was no evidence that they could use to get me back in court. Now, fast forward, I have this video. And after reaching out to so many different attorneys, I reach out to them once more. And I said, please, if you just watch the video, You'll see for yourself. And um, there's a lady in that office uh, at the California Innocence Project at the time. Her name was Kim Hernandez. She was the project coordinator. She wasn't an attorney. She was the person that was like, you know, handling the business side of things. She answered the call and she said, OK, I'll meet you to look at the video. I'll bring one of the lawyers with me. She was nice. Um, here I was risking my, my, my freedom again, because they were all the way in San Diego. I was in LA. I couldn't leave the state. I couldn't leave LA County as a parole condition. So i lied to my parole officer. I said, Hey, I got this job interview, but the headquarters for the job is in San Diego. I need to go get interviewed. He gave me a pass to drive out. Um, so I actually didn't even go to San Diego. They met me halfway in the city somewhere. Forgot the city. Even though she admitted that, could you have still got in trouble because you've you leave it in yes, her presence? Yes, how does that? Yes, how did yes, that yes. balance out? So, yes. So uh, to make a long story short, I showed them the video. They took on my case, um, and when they took on my case, immediately they told me, "Hey, you know, just because you have this video, don't mean that you're going to get your life back." Because she could have said she was threatened. She could have been down. Well, she other did way. all of that. Yeah, but yeah. even more, the the judge could have said, I don't like the way you guys went about getting this video. I don't like the way you went about getting the recantation. Because you can, can you record without people? You can record if the person is, has been given the knowledge that recording is, is taking place in the vicinity, which we made sure we put signs all over the office, outside the office, this will be recorded. Inside the room she was sitting in, there were walls with signs everywhere. We did it on purpose. But the judge still could have made that video uh, not admissible, which would have left me with no evidence, which would have put me back to square one. So we had to play more chess and not checkers. And the Were way you we still in contact with her at this time, just to keep her sweet? No, once she came forward, I shut the shit down. It was over. I didn't need to talk to her at all about anything. There was no reason for me to even talk to her. I got you on tape admitting you lied. Uh -huh. um, so before we took it to the judge, what we decided to do was take it to the media. If we put it out there to the world, then there's no way that the courts could sweep this under the rug, no matter what the technicalities are, because the video is so damaging for her because she's literally admitting to everything while laughing about it. You know? Um, so we went to the media, which was basically me showing the world that I came in contact with, the supposed victim, which is an automatic violation of my parole and my parole officer could send me to prison for it. So we put together this big uh, interview, this big scoop. Uh, it was uh, one of the big news networks in L.A. And uh, uh, the, uh, the reporter, his name is Randy Page. God bless him. He stuck with me through the whole process of getting my case turned over. Um, but uh, we put it out there and literally that night phone rang. As soon as it aired, it was my pro officer. Just saw your ass on TV. Come to my office in the morning. I'm like, fuck, I'm going to jail. I get to the office in the morning. He's hot. He's going off. You know, da, 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 this, 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 and that. He's going off. I'm thinking I'm about to go to jail. And at the end of his rant, he's like, you know, you're lucky. The, uh, you know, my boss and these people saw it too. And they believe you. 
So what we're going to do is what they told me to do is to basically remodify your parole conditions that state you can't come into contact with the supposed victim at all unless it's court related. And so they basically created a loophole for me. The parole office did uh, that kept me from going back to jail for coming in contact with her. Basically, us going to the media helped me more uh, in 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 the situation than her than than anything because it put everybody uh, in a position where they couldn't ignore what they saw, mm -hmm. couldn't ignore it because you, know? it, you could have got that video and oh, it would have been it been it would have been an outcry. You're back it in would have been a public again. outcry if they sent me to jail after that. You know, this man got a video of the girl yeah. saying she didn't do it. And you sent the man back to prison for it. You know, it would have been a crazy outcry. So it worked in our favor. Is this the first time you'd felt as if? life was starting to work in your favor again first time first time well getting the video the recantation i was like i got that and then when the media thing worked in our favor that was huge too because what happened after that was once it went to the media um m my lawyers the california innocence project were able to do something that had never happened before and i don't think i don't know if it has happened since um the da agreed to uh, he listened to me without any court being involved. My lawyer was at a, a uh, the head of the Innocence Project was at another one of their cases that they were fighting, and he noticed that the lead detect, I mean, the lead um, district attorney was there watching him, one of his junior DAs fight the case. He was in the audience. When the case was over, uh, my lawyer went to him and said, I got this kid named Brian Banks. You know, he's got this video. It's been on the news. We really just, you just listen to him. And he agreed. All right, have him. If he can show up within a few hours, I'll sit and talk with him. So he calls me. He's like, put on some nice, get to the fucking court office right now. So I get dressed. I smash over to the court office. Um, and I literally, I literally sat in the office with my two lawyers the DA, lead DA, and the lead investigator for the DA's office, and they interviewed me. And at the end of that interview, they agreed to join in a joint investigation into my case, which never happens. Um, and that joint investigation basically um, uh, put the girl on the run. She basically went into hiding. Um, they couldn't find her. They were, you know, and now you would think that, um, so, let me, let me first say this. She went into hiding. The DA's office were trying to locate her, not to help me, but to help themselves. They, if anything, want their conviction to stick. They don't want their, their conviction to be overturned. So tracking her down and getting her back on the right track would be in their favor. She's basically answering the phone, telling the DA, fuck you, catch me if you can. I'm not coming to court. I'm not talking to nobody. No. Um, they had to subpoena her. They had to do all these different things, basically threaten her freedom for her to show up. Eventually, one of the court dates, she showed up. They interviewed her. And at the end of that interview, they realized that she had made everything up and it was a total lie. And that's what uh, that's what ultimately got me free. Um, I went to court um, May 24th, 2012. And... I had a feeling something good was going to happen. We didn't know for sure, but basically we went into the courtroom and this is on video too. It's on YouTube. Um, the judge comes out. My lawyer asked to speak to the judge up front. The DA and my lawyer walk up to the, to the judge. They whisper to each other. Um, I, obviously in agreeance, um, they come back to the tables and um, the DA says, we'd like to d dismiss this case, uh, you know, due to section code, this, 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 and that. Um, this this guy's innocent, uh, and the judge granted it. Now, what's crazy about it is the judge that granted uh, the 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 conviction to be overturned is the same judge that convicted me. So, ten years later, I'm back in court looking at the same judge that gave me a six year sentence, and now I'm looking at him saying, "Okay, this over, you know, this will be granted. Okay, case dismissed. No apology. No, I'm sorry. No." You know, I hope you do well. You were a kid then. I'm sorry. Nothing. It was like, all right, granted, granted. All right, case dismissed. And he just walks away. And uh, and that was it, man. I, I dropped my head to the table. Oh, man. And I just, uh, 
it was like an electric shock. Man. It was like a jolt of, of life, of, of air, of freedom, of struggle, of fight, of everything. Bro. I was shaking. I'm, 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 I put my head down. I'm covering my face and my eyes were as wide as they can be while I'm huddling. And I just, I, I was almost like just over, like it was just like almost too much energy just surging through me all at once. Just I'm feeling my life coming back, you know? Um, and just like that, man, just, you know, just with a few words, I got my life back and I wasn't just found innocent. I was found factually innocent. So there's a difference. Um, innocent means that, you know, the courts don't have enough to convict you. <laughs> like, All right, you innocent. Cause we don't have enough. Um, factually innocent is, yeah, we, we fucked up. We made a huge mistake. You, you should have never went to jail for this. So I was found factually innocent. And, what happened uh, to her? Nothing. So um, this is what law needs to change. False accusations. You sh if someone gets to prison time, you should be doing double what they've done. Million percent. Look, yeah. men need more protection. Listen, men fuck up. Mm -hmm. All the destruction in the world is a majority of men. We get it. But the false accusations, there needs to be laws in place because if there's laws in place, and I know a lot of people are scared to come forward when this stuff does happen, so I'm not discrediting anybody but men need protection from this sort of shit like because it does happen quite mm -hmm. frequently too frequently where lives are destroyed mm -hmm. your life was totally ruined your mum's life was ruined every bit of anyone love for you probably life was ruined because they've seen a young rising star who could have potentially been in the nfl making millions providing for his family yeah and so so be it that you're fucking king i totally agree i tell i say it all the time it's not a matter of you know, uh, do women lie or whatnot? People lie. Humans yeah, lie. Yeah, lie. For gain, for protection, out of fear. Whatever, you know, whatever's going on in their lives dictates what they're going to say. People lie. It's not a matter of man or woman. It's people. And in this case, this woman lied. And in other cases, women do lie. And, and, and yes, there should be some type of repercussion, punishment. I totally agree. Here's the thing. <laughs> the law needs to be changed. There's a statute in the state of California. There's a statute of limitation of eight years that after eight years, it's impossible to go after somebody for perjury. You cannot go after someone for lying in court after eight years. I was locked up for 10 years. So how am I, how am I supposed to know that during my five years of prison and five years of parole that I was supposed to go after a person for perjury uh, when I pled no contest to a crime that I didn't commit, how am I supposed to know that? And who's going to believe me? And who's going to help me fight that case? You know, eight years, it's, you can't go after that person. So criminally, nothing happened to her. She was countersued by the school district and the court system um, and now owes $2.5 million. But she doesn't have a dollar to her name. She doesn't have anything. So they'll never get a dollar from her. So nothing has happened to her other than being what I like to say is uh, guilty by Google. You look up her name, you look up her face, you know who it is, you know the story. But that's the extent of it. Nothing has happened. And so I do agree with you in situations like this where someone has lied in, in court and has ruined someone's life for a number of years, um, whether you're a woman, man, whatever, you got to face the music. You can't get away with shit like that. That we should not have a law or a system that allows a person to destroy one's life and and walk away from it unscathed. No repercussion, no punishment whatsoever. For the sake of what? What are we protecting? Why do you think the whole thing happened? Could it have been a possibly set up to f make this happen? Or was it just one of those things where she was scared and she didn't know where to go? Because, listen, as much as she's a fucking evil bitch, like... Mm -hmm. You still don't understand her story. It seems as if she's came from a right fucked up home yep. where she's probably trying to protect herself, not yep. realising the extent of it. It's went too far. Yep. But still, again, you never look, ruin someone's life like that. So I, I'm mm. trying to... I don't want to shoot her down too much because it sounds as if she is really fucked up in the yeah, head. She made a lie. She made a, she made a, she made the initial lie. She did that. You know, that's, let's, let's take responsibility. She made the initial lie. She caused this whole thing to begin. And even if it was out of fear of her mother or fear of the school or fear of the police that were involved, she continued to double down and triple down and quadruple down on those lies to protect herself from whatever it was that she was trying to protect herself from. 
And I'm not saying that that is justifiable in any way, because in the process of trying to protect yourself with lies, you've destroyed the lives of many. You've up, you've, you've put a whole new, not only did she, did she mess up my life and my family's life, but our community, our neighborhood, the people that we all know, the people that we grew up with, the boys in our, like my story is used at my high school to this day. Warning boys, watch your up, you know, be safe, do the, make the right choices, but not the other way around. Hey, don't make lies. Tell the truth. Be honest. You know, um, so there's definitely, there's definitely a lot that needs to change. Laws need to change. Statute of limitations need to change. People being held accountable for their actions uh, needs to change. Like a lot. I totally yeah, agree with you. Definitely. But it's quite a personal question. But when you get out of prison, things are going great. How do you then have split sex with a girl for the first time yeah. in your mind without, yeah. oh, was everything okay? It wasn't that even, easy. <laughs> even, even at, do you know what I'm saying? But even at that, even if someone's saying, yeah, they're, they're consenting, in your mind they're thinking, what did I do when I leave this room? Or what, do you know what I'm saying? How hard was that to then yeah. build some sort of trust? Yeah, it's funny. <clears throat> I had no dating life when I was on parole. Um, I had relationships. And those relationships were formed uh, by way of me having to expose my entire situation to them prior to anything physical happening. That was for me to do. I was so afraid coming home from prison of meeting women, of dating, of uh, anything. For one, I had the GPS on my ankle, so if I was going to get down and do something, you're going to see that. Second of all, I never wanted to put my hands on a woman until you knew everything because I didn't want you to find out later and feel like you've been lied to or tricked. And then I become, you know, I'm back in, you know, some situation again with some female who's saying I took advantage of her by not making her privy to what I had been through. So I'll give you an example. The first relationship that I was in, I got into a relationship. You know, I, 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 I got out. Obviously, you have your hormones running. You want to, you know, catch up on lost time. But I, I never jumped out and did it freely or openly. I was on parole. I was a sex offender. I, I didn't feel comfortable doing that. So instead, I found a girl I really liked. I would date her. I, I went out with her a bunch of times. And we talked, we talked, we talked. And then eventually, I remember like it was yesterday, I took her to the beach. We went on this long walk and I, I got to tell you something. And I told her and she didn't really understand the full thing. The next phase was come to my house. Here's the paperwork. I'm pulling all out the rid of habeas corpus. I'm showing all of this. I'm bringing my mom. Let me meet you. I want you to meet my mom. She meets my mom. My mom's talking to her about it. They having a girl on girl talk when I'm not involved. And then allowing her to make the decision on her own to come to me and tell me in my face, I believe you. I'm here for you. I got your back. I'm with you. It's like having to get all your dating is like a court case. Now we can talk about having sex or being <laughs> physical. You know what I'm saying? Like there and, and that that was it was like that in both the two relationships that I was in that I was on I was on parole for five years and I was in two relationships throughout that entire time. I was never single, I was never dating, I never went on a date. I didn't have money for a date. I couldn't even take you on a date if I wanted to. You know, uh, my dates consisted of going on long walks. <laughs> you know, I didn't have my own house. Where am I going to take you to go get down and get busy? You know, I had curfew. I couldn't be out late past a certain time. You know, so me dating in the beginning, it just didn't exist. The best thing that I could do was to get into a relationship and find somebody who believed me. Did you ever get a sorry from anyone? Like? From the judge, from that ghetto? <laughs> I've never gotten a sorry from anybody. I've never had one person that has been on the other side of this apologize to me for anything. The judge, my lawyer, the woman who made the accusation, her family, nobody. I've never heard one person say, I'm sorry that this happened to you. It shouldn't have happened to you. I'll give it. I, the only person I will say that is the person who who made the wrong right, which was the, the lead DA uh, who got it who, who interviewed me who created the joint investigation who stood in front of the judge and said we're dismissing this case um, his name is Brent Ferrer rest in peace he's no longer with us um, he went on from becoming the lead DA in Los Angeles 
to uh, actually uh, volunteering his time with the uh, Innocence Project of Loyola in Los Angeles. He, all because of the, the hard work of the Innocence Project, um, how they were able to prove my case and a few other cases, it really touched him in a way to where he left the DA's office and got involved on, on, on helping other cases of wrongful conviction. Because it must be difficult because it's such a sensitive case the majority of girls do are telling the truth as well, mm -hmm. and the majority of guys will probably be saying they've never done anything. So mm -hmm. people would sway towards the girls' story more towards the guys, and plus you've admitted to it, so people will think and will Absolutely. Flip so you can understand that, but again, when you hear your story in depth, what you went through, what your mum went through, to being falsely accused, to spending fucking five years, six years in prison, football career ruined, getting out, getting a confession, but again, with your story, it's like a fucking roller coaster with her. We're the creators of our life before this. I don't understand why you would want to create this life because it'd be far too fucking draining. Yeah. But the ups and the downs, but it ends up becoming a silver lining. You actually end up fulfilling your fucking dreams and becoming an NFL star from the graces of God or whatever. How did that come about? Was that straight away once you found out you were innocent? Just no, man. This is me. Um, this did you still believe that you were always going to? Yeah. Whether it was a short lived. We had a we had a football league in prison. And no, you know, no pads, no helmets and shit like that. But I was tearing shit up out there. You know what I mean? So I knew I still had it. You know, I was, you know, just straight up. It was like rugby out there, just, you know, hitting each other. But for me, what it was, was when I was on parole and this girl came forward, we got her on tape admitting that she lied. Immediately when we recovered that and all of that took place, my mind told me, Brian, you have an opportunity to get your life back. And upon getting your life back, if it happens, when it happens, you are going to have a small window of opportunity to do whatever it is that you want to do in your life. And people will listen. Prepare yourself for that window of opportunity. Whether it's going to present itself or not, whether you're going to have the opportunity or not, be ready in case it does happen. So, when the California Innocence Project took my case on and I had that recantation video, it took a year for them to appeal my case, to fight the case to the point of me being um, found innocent and the whole thing being thrown out. During that entire year that they fought my case, I was in the gym. I found my old, I got my old homeboy. He, he was a trainer. Uh, his name is Marcus Hobbs. He was training at a gym called Metroflex. I don't know if you know who C.T. Fletcher is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like C.T. Before yeah. C.T. Well, was always a legend yeah, yeah, amongst yeah. us, but before he blew up and had this huge uh, surge of notoriety, he was our pops in our gym who motivated us. But I was with those guys when Metroflex was just just Metroflex, and all those guys there believed in me, um, and it was partly due to Marcus and knowing who I was and him vouching for me. But he started training me. I came to him out the blue. I said, look, man, that girl came forward. I think I'm gonna be getting my life back. I wanna be ready for any opportunities with the NFL. And he was the first person to not laugh and say, what the fuck are you talking about? He said, all right, let's 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 go. And I started showing up at the gym four or five in the morning, training with him. Um, uh, and uh, then I started training with other uh, trainers, Chris Albert, uh, and, and other folks. Um, and basically for that year that they fought my case, I was training twice a day. Uh, I got on the eating regimen. I started losing 30 pounds. I, I started getting on the field and doing field work. I hadn't talked to a recruiter. I hadn't talked to a coach. I hadn't talked to anybody associated with the NFL. I just knew that if I got my life back, that I would have a window of opportunity and I need to be ready for it. And so I trained for that entire year. And I, I, I got into the best shape I had ever been in my life. Um, and uh, sure enough, I got my life back. I was exonerated. I walked out of that courtroom and uh, outside of the courthouse, there was maybe 15, 20 different reporters from news to radio to, uh, you know, international news. And everyone was there asking the same question. What now? What now? What now? And, um, I said, I want to play football. And then my lawyer was like, you know, get this guy an opportunity. And, you know, a few people laughed at the, the whole idea of the NFL. And little did they know that whole year I was in there fucking training, getting ready, 
busting my butt, getting up late. I mean, getting up early, going to bed late, eating right, lifting weights, running. Uh, and the next day that I made that, that I was exonerated and I made that plea, uh, my phone rang and it was Pete Carroll, uh, the head coach of Seahawks. Seahawks. Uh, he was the head coach of USC when I was in high school. He was the one who presented me with the opportunity to go play for USC. He, my first recruit, uh, my first um, scholarship offer, which was a verbal offer, came from them, Pete Carroll and his squad. Is there money in that from college football? There's no money. Is there any signing? At that time, NIL. No signing. No on fees, the, is it? No, there's no yeah, signing on fees. None of that but stuff it's a, existed. But it fucking sets you up for life when you start Absolutely. processing through it. Yeah, so... He he said uh, he called me and he said I'm looking for a linebacker man you know where I can find one and I I I didn't know who it was I'm like yeah I'm like yeah you got you know got the right number man who is this and he's you know it's me man it's Pete and it was just crazy man it was we it was like it was just, you know here we were doing this recruiting dance all over again you know from high school to now in pros and he's like I I've been keeping up with what's been going on on the news and I see you got your life back I'm so happy for you I'm proud of you I'm sorry you went through all of this you know we. I don't know if you've been working out or not, but if you know, if so, we love to give you an opportunity. And you don't, you can't imagine the smile on my face. Like I'm sitting on the phone and I just smirk, like because I knew I've been training, I've been working out, and sure enough, here was that window of opportunity. Now I could have very well not worked out, not did anything, and he calls and he says, "Hey man, I'd love to give you a shot." Oh, coach, thanks, man. I, I am not in any kind of shape. I, you know, I'm not even ready for that, and it would have been over. But luckily, I took. You know, I took the initiative and uh, I was ready. So he was like, you, you've been working out? Oh, okay, cool. He flew me out the next day. <laughs> He's like, all right, you're coming to Seattle the next day. You want to see what you got? And uh, I remember that day I was being, uh, I had an interview with The Tonight Show. Uh, Jay Leno, it was his, Jay Leno was one of his last few episodes before he was out the door. And I did The Tonight Show and I hopped on a flight that night. I was a red eye and went out there and I tried out for the Seahawks. They loved what they saw. They invited me back to training camp. I did training camp with them and uh, ultimately did not get signed. After that, um, five other teams started, you know, all the teams started reaching out, which was awesome. You know what I'm saying? And I, I tried out for five other football teams, um, including the Atlanta Falcons. I signed with the Falcons um, the following year. When I tried out with them, it was towards the beginning of their season. And they said, look, if we sign you now, the whole season's focus is going to be you. Like, it, and it's just not a good look right now for what we're trying to do. So after the season, we'll bring you in, you know, at the end of the season to get you acclimated during our downtime. And sure enough, I went to play in the UFL, which is the United Football League. It's like a lower level professional league ball. I did that for one season. Uh, well, actually half a season, the, the league folded and went defunct. Um, but sure enough, at the end of the season, uh, Falcons called me back and uh, said, you, you know, you pass your physical, you know, you, you're in. Uh, flew me out, saw the doc, passed the physical and went through a couple of trainings with them. They loved it. Signed with the Falcons. Um, I had an opportunity to go through training camp, summer camp. I played four games with the Falcons um, before being let go. I was a 28 year old rookie, probably one of the oldest rookies to ever play in the NFL ever. No, no no, college background, didn't go to college, straight out of high school. And I had an opportunity to run out on the, on the field with um, with some greats, man. Um, and uh, I had a chance to play in the NFL for a few games, man. It was uh, What was that like? Yeah, All those hard, years. It's kind of hard to put into words. Lying man. in a prison cell, fucking known as a rapist, like yeah. thinking there's no way out. But yep. that feeling there, that everything that you've put in, everything that you believed as a kid, everything that you probably still had that in a belief, even when you were in prison, even though you were doing five years, it meant that you always probably still had that belief. Always. So when you run out in that field as an NFL player, what what was the feeling? Was it mixed emotions? That was the... That was the... That was the last chapter to that horrible story for me. And I know, mind, mind you, I still... I still live it, you know. I still think about it. I still, yeah, because I have my dreams. That, what could have been? Yeah, must be a hard one. Yeah, but uh, I mean, what I'm saying is, I still have my dreams of what I went through. Yeah, I still, you know, one of my, I never shared this with anybody, but one of my 
I only have one nightmare. I don't have any other nightmares. I've been having the same nightmare since I got home. And that nightmare is I today is my day of parole. I'm supposed to be getting out, but for some reason they're not letting me out. And I'm frantically running around the prison asking what the fuck's going on. Why am I not? And it sounds very simple. Um, but when you've been through what I've been through, um, it's, it's a pretty horrific dream when you're, you're stuck in prison and you can't get out. Um, but I mean, I still have my dreams. I still have my moments, but I felt like that, that opportunity to play in the NFL for the small time that I was there was closing the book to that, that horrible experience. It was a, I told you so it was a, I'm here now. And it was a mom, we did it. And regardless of whatever happens after this, mom, like we did it, we're free. And I, and I recaptured the dream that I said that I was going to recapture. Um, so it was kind of like, it was kind of a, you know, closing chapter into all the shit that had gone down, man, for the last 10 years of my life. Um, to finally be where I was supposed to be before it all went down on the field with the guys playing ball. It's a phenomenal story, brother. I know it's a painful one, but the end product of it is what makes sense. The end product is, a, is what, okay, somebody's got to go through pain. Everybody goes through pain to a certain degree. You've just went through more than most. Why do you think it happened to you, though? Why you? Why were you dealt those cards? Do you ever ask that question? You know... I, I try my best not to ask that question um, because my whole life was centered around that. Why, 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 why? And occasionally, you know, I it happens still. Um, but I, I try to replace that thought right away with it did happen. And you can sit here and focus on why it happened or you can accept the fact that it did happen. And you can look at what you did as a response to what you went through not just what you went through. I feel like we all have our experiences. We all go through things of the unwanted, things that we never thought we'd want to go through. You have been through something that I will never in my life want to experience. I know for a fact, right? Which tells me that it's not the experience, you know, but how we deal with the experience, how we allow that experience to affect us, what we choose to do as a response, because no experience comes with emotion. We apply emotions to experiences, right? Something happens in our life. We choose to get angry about it. And experiences don't come with anger. This happened. This is how I'm choosing to feel about it. And I came to a realization that I have to remain in the driver's seat uh, when dealing with my emotions. I can't let my emotions drive the car because I'll never get anywhere. You know, I always have to remain the driver in my life and not letting my emotions drive, not applying the wrong emotions to experiences um, and just trying to. Trying to to find ways that I can continuously better myself despite everything that I've gone through. And I still like I said, I still have those moments. You know, there's no way you can go through a 10 year experience that I went through and think that, you know, because I played a few football games, because there's a movie out about my life, because now I'm free and I get to walk around, that I'm no longer going to question why this happened, that I'm no longer going to think about what I went through, that it's not going to haunt me ever again. It does. It does. It absolutely does. But what I focus on is how I apply the emotions to the experience. Um, and that's always in our control, always in our control. I use this analogy when I do speaking engagements, say you and me are in the car and, and I'm the driver and you're the passenger and I'm driving over a hundred miles an hour and I'm going crazy. I'm just going crazy driving. And there's a car parked at a red light and I don't see it to the last minute. And as soon as I see it, I slam the brake and we just slide. We get right behind this car. We almost smack it, but we don't. Right. One experience, two different reactions, because both of us are in the car. You may get out of the car, take off your seatbelt and drop to your knees. Oh, God, I made it. I'm still alive. I'm still here. Thank you. Oh, 
you go home, kiss your family, kiss your babies, kiss your wife. Now you're going to church on Sundays. You now you're the employee of the month at work. Now you got a better relationship with your family members that you used to hate. Your whole life has changed because of this one experience of near death. Me as a driver, I laughed it off and just kept going, peel off and just keep going. No, no, no effect whatsoever. It shows us that it's not the experience. It's the person dealing with the experience and how they allow the experience to affect them and what they choose to do as a response to the experience. You went through an experience as the passenger that gave you clarity into your life. I went to the, through an experience as a driver that it had no effect on me at all. And you see this all the time. Guys that go in and out of prison, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Or the guy who went to jail for two days and was like, fuck that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I got it. I figured it out. You know, that's me. You know, I, I, uh, I, I see opportunities for bettering myself and not hanging on to what has happened. If I hang on to that shit, if I keep dwelling on it, if I keep asking why, it's just going to set me back. Uh -huh. Instead of asking why, I just accept what it was and I just find the way to be better than the accusation, the experience, the wrongful conviction. Um, and that's really all we can do, man, with the things that we go through in life. Life is simply life and, and all of life is not good. How's life now? Life, life is, you know, I feel like I lived, I feel like I have a life like anybody else. You know, I have my ups, I have my downs, I have my good moments, I have my bad moments. But what I can tell you is that none of what I went through dictates that. It's what's going on in the moment that dictate, that dictates it. I've learned how to manage the past. Occasionally, I'll have those moments where, you know, it's resurfacing. I've had a bad dream or you know, it was, you know, something happened where I'm now I'm thinking about it, but I've learned how to. All right. Ain't nothing you can do about the past. Ain't going to change what's already happened, but you can focus on what's going on right now, you know, and what you do in this moment determine what determines what happens next. That's my main focus. I'm, 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 I'm a I'm always in the playbook trying to make the next play. How was it becoming a father? Greatest moment in my life. Greatest moment in my life. Um, even more so, I would say, being exonerated, proving my innocence, uh, getting my life back, and being able to create life. Um, I feel like they're one and the same. Um, my son is totally changed. He has changed my perspective on life. Uh, on love, on, on 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 understanding people, um, I I I dreamed about my son. You know, I was telling you earlier. I when I was in prison, I I dreamed of my son. I saw his face. I knew his name. Um, and here and he's here now. Um, but he's he's shown me how to. Uh, He's given me a more hope than I've ever had before. I've always had a drive of my own, but I think he's just given me an added purpose or a, a main focus. And that's just um, giving him a life that I never had, um, providing him with the type of family I never had, um, showing him what a man should be. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm a full time dad. I, I spend. I spend my days with him, you know, and um, yeah, he's everything to me, man. He's 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 everything. He's he's the future, and he's definitely, you know, I'm I'm a I I'm I'm one of those guys where I, you know, we need we need more beautiful, strong, educated, well respected uh, men in this world, and I'm so thankful that I'm in an op I'm in a position to have a son uh, to uh, to help. Uh, add another good you know good man into this world and I, I know he's gonna be great and he's gonna do great things but he's he's uh he's he's my magic man he's he's my guy i love him to death he's a good kid man yeah uh, good stuff brother. how was it when the movie came out did it bring back a lot of emotions or oh yeah was that a good way to wipe the slate clean to try and move on yeah man um yeah, well, the movie definitely brought on a lot of emotion. Um, the first time I watched the film, 
was a test screening um, at a, um, it was a, a small studio uh, movie theater. And they put the movie on and I was in a theater by myself. Um, and uh, it was a small like test theater. So it was probably maybe about 40 seats, 50 seats in there. And um, I sat in the middle, they turned the lights off, they played it. And uh, I probably lost weight as many tears as I cried. <laughs> I probably <laughs> lost a few pounds that day just from tears. Maybe I should stop fucking crying that movie. <laughs> I need to lose some I beef. probably lost a few pounds, man, crying, man. I'm telling you, like, I just let it all out. But it was uh, to see your life. It was, a, talk about flashbacks, you know. It, you know, obviously everything in the film is not 1,000% accurate, but um, there's, there's, it's very close. And, uh, it, it was uh it was a tough watch but i've seen it so many times now i've you know i've you know i travel around i'm a i'm a public speaker i'm a keynote speaker i do leadership speaking resiliency resiliency speaking um i you know i do a lot of movie and q a opportunities so i've seen the film so many times i've been on stage talking about my life so much over the last uh 11 almost 12 years uh, that it, you know, it's 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 become a lot easier. But yeah, initially watching that film, it was devastating. It was it was really hard to watch, um, hard to relive some of those moments, hard to you know see. Uh, like for example, the, the scene of my mom crying and screaming when I'm getting pulled out of the, out of my house and arrested. Like they, you know, we redid that. We recreate recreated that uh that scene and. Uh, I wasn't there. I was I was there when we filmed the whole movie. We filmed the whole movie in Memphis, Tennessee, and I was on set. You know, I was a, a, a executive producer, um, so I you know had a lot of input, obviously, into what was going on in the film and how things were being depicted. And uh, there are certain scenes I just didn't show up for when we were filming them. Yeah, today is a scene where you know you get arrested. And your mom's gonna be okay. I, I'm I'm not gonna be there. I won't be there for that. I'm gonna I will show up. I'm gonna tell everybody what it was and how it was, and then I'm just gonna disappear. And the same thing too with my mom. I remember when she came uh, on set, I flew her out from LA to the movie set when we were filming and it was crazy. She was so happy to be there and so excited to be there and she was meeting everybody and shaking hands and hugging everybody. And then it was like, all right, let's start it up. And uh, it was the monologue that Sherry Shepard did uh, when she was talking to the DA about, do you have a son? And, you know, what would you do if your son was in this situation? And, and literally within minutes, she just had to walk away. She just broke down crying. I can't do this. I can't do this. And she walked away, you know, but so it's always, it's tough. It's tough, but it's so worth it, you know, because there's so many people behind bars right now for crimes they didn't commit. There's so many people um, that are voiceless, that have no one reaching out and speaking up for them, helping them out, um, you know. I had an opportunity to turn my hardship into a tool uh, for people to learn from, to live vicariously through, um, and to have and to develop hope from that in their situations or their family member situation or friend situation that you know that that they can get through what they went through, whatever that whatever it may be. Um, so I'm I. I I value that. I stepped up to I stepped up to the plate for that. You know, it was a choice of do you want to make a film or not. I wasn't always gun ho on like making a film, um, but the conversation kept coming up and the discussions kept coming up on how beneficial this film could be, how it could help people, how it could change the the perception of our legal system, and it just made sense that I went through everything that I went through, um, uh, maybe to to be a beacon of hope for others. Where do you go forward for the future, brother? Um, continue to the good fight, man. I'm, I'm, I try, like I said, uh, my main focus is, is traveling um, as a uh, educator and speaker on wrongful convictions, um, uh, on uh, overcoming adversity, uh, and resiliency. I'm gonna continue that, I think, as much as I can. As, uh, however many people, you know, uh, want to hear my story, I'll be there to, to tell it. You know, I, it's a story that needs to be told and it's a story that represents so many other people and, and other experiences. 
Um, aside from that, I'll continue raising my son, being a good dad, um, and just living life uh, as it comes, enjoying it as I can. Uh, I, I can't tell the future. I try. I tend to live in the moment and live for today. Um, and today is just, uh, you know, it's a day to just be thankful. You know, I'm here talking to you, and it 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 here's another opportunity for me to share a story. Um, that so many people can resonate with. And it, it's not even about, you know, I, I can relate to this because I've, I've been wrongfully accused or I've been in jail. It's beyond that. We are all going through things in life that we never thought we would go through. We never thought we would experience, but here we are in that situation. And there aren't too many places to turn to where you can decipher how to deal with certain things. You know, you could read these self-help books and uh, you could listen to people online telling you to just deal with it. You know, you go and it's like, it's, it's harder than that. You know, you can't certain things you just can't deal with. But if you could show, if you could show someone pushing and pushing and never giving up and finding ways to be better and finding ways to prove their innocence and doing all that they can to, uh, to 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 push past the adversity, um, you know. I think that those those stories are the stories that need to be told, and the ones that we should continue to um, to enhance and and and, and enlighten. Um, so I try to now instead of you know looking at the why me, I, I kind of look at it now as um, why not me? Because you know I'm I'm in a position now where. Um, I can talk about it. I can, you know, I can express um, what I've gone through and how I dealt with it. And um, it's it's uh, it's therapeutic for me in a lot of ways. You know, every time I get on stage and I talk, um, you know, even though I'm talking about stuff that I always talk about, there's going to be a question that comes in from the audience that's going to be probably something I've never been asked before which is going to put my brain into, you know, different thoughts and flashbacks and thinking of old stuff. And maybe it'll help me, you know, navigate through that and uh, gain another piece of clarity on this. And, you know, and uh, I enjoy those moments, clarity, you know. For anybody that's maybe in a life of trouble just now, what advice would you have for them? The advice for anybody that may be in similar trouble or just trouble in general? Just trouble in general, life's troubles. <sighs> Man. I would I would definitely go back to uh, the the emotional control. I think one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest things that we can master is control of our emotions. Um, sometimes our emotions get the best of us and will put us in far worse situations than we were in the beginning. Um, you know, even if it's something as small, I won't say small because for someone else it's big. Even if it's a, a breakup, you know you when you break up with someone you love so much, you know, and you can sit there and dwell on all the negative things and, and you'll, by the time you finish dwelling, you'll be in the same place. Um, or you can, uh, look at the positives, uh, uh, redirect your emotions and how you allow the situation to affect you and do something, uh, you know, positive about it or something more reinforcing that helps you progress and move forward in life, um, versus stagnates you. Um, another analogy I use, I'll say real quick is, uh, remember when you were a little kid and your mom and your dad told you, you know, go in there and clean up that dirty room and you go into your room and you see how dirty your room is. And instead of cleaning it, you just throw a tantrum because you don't want to clean it. You kick it and you scream and you fight in the air and you cry and you drop it on the ground and you're flailing all over the place, you know, and your brother comes in and you're asking your brother to help you clean it. And your brother says no. And your sister peeks in and you ask your sister to help you clean it. She says no. And, you know, you eventually you stop kicking and you stop screaming. And you stop crying and you, you wipe your eyes and you stand up and you look around the room. And the room is still dirty. You just spent 20, 30 minutes of your life kicking, screaming, begging other people to help you come change the outcome of your room life. Right. And nothing changed because you didn't do it. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to is things that we go through in life can easily uh, be overcome in some fashion or form if you put that work into doing it. Um, it, it. It really comes down to 
you wanting more for yourself than anybody else could want for you. And I think that's what got me through my experience was the fact that I was never going to quit regardless of what I was going through. I was always going to keep pushing um, because nobody else going to push for you the way you could push for yourself. You know, so I would tell people to focus on the things that you can focus on and uh, never mind the things that you can't uh, until you can uh, learn how to deal with your emotions and not let your emotions deal with you. Um, and always remember what you do in this moment determines what happens next. So make the next move your best move. How can people get in contact with you if people are looking maybe to hire you for work or just ask you a simple question on social media? What's all your platforms, brother? Yeah, all of my social media handles is Brian Banks Free, F-R-E-E. Uh, my, my website, brianbanksfree.com. Um, I have everything up there as far as my story uh, to... Um, my journey as a public speaker. Um, so if anybody has any questions or wants to network and work together, I'm always available. I'm always looking for opportunities to further uh, tell them my story and the stories of others. Brother, well, Lesson, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, I mean, I, uh, if anything, man, just thank you. I, I really thank you because I, I, I really respect you and what you're doing, your podcast, um, the the platform um, that you've created has grown so huge and you've you've gained so much success from it. So I first of all, I want to say congratulations to you. Okay. Um, and then thank you for using that platform to, to highlight a story such as mine, um, because uh, there's so many other stories out there that's a lot more attractive and sexier, um, you know, that may get more clicks. Um, but uh, you're focusing on a, a really a uh, good subject here. Um, and uh, I think people will, will will see that and resonate with that. Keep doing your thing, man. Yeah, sure. yeah well, much respect to you, Listen, mate, nothing but love, man. <laughs> it's a phenomenal story, and yes, I wish sir. you nothing but the best for you, the future for you and your son and Thank you, your brother. partner. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.